Why is there music? Can you share music? See at the bottom all the buttons? There's one that says Oh yeah, like music. if you unmute it, there's music. It's got like elevator music. So it does. What the hell? <laughs> I don't know what's happening. Hmm. Oh. <laughs> this week on Mythos Busters are fascinated by simple technology. <laughs> <laughs> I know. We need that we need that music when we're doing our like game shows yeah. and someone's thinking. This week on OK Boomer, the lads <laughs> learn how to use Discord. <laughs> what does this button do? We're we were already five minutes late. Do you want to just get this sucker rolling? Uh, I mean, if we're gonna have another three hour episode, we gotta start sometime. Yep. <sighs> you can't pod- you can't podcast all night if you don't start in the evening. Is that a <laughs> I, I'm gonna do my best to not yammer i felt like i yammered a little bit last episode i I just like that you put in our chat like hey let's just we're we're getting kind of long let's keep it you know well paced and then you just go off on fucking i was like oh tentacle time no i want to do like the longest tentacle time that we've done (laughs) in episodes let's do that you you had missed the previous one so you had to make up for it and then we were talking mystics it was just gonna happen yeah it's true it got me it got me it got my juices flowing Mm -hmm. Mm mm-hmm mm-hmm and I mean, you know, we always say like when there's good cards, we don't say much. When there's bad cards, we say more. And we're talking about mystics, <laughs> so there's going to be tons of talking, right? <laughs> oh, shots fired! <laughs> I didn't even try to dodge those ones. This survivor episode next time is going to be like 20 minutes tops. <laughs> good card. Look at all the good red good cards. Card. Mythos Busters, investigating the mystery, monsters, and madness of Arkham Horror, the card game. Hello and welcome to episode 153 of Mythos Busters. I'm Sean, and joining me tonight are my buddies. we got the full crew here tonight. Uh, We've got Ian. Hey, Ian. Oh, hello. We missed you last time. I know, but I had to be here for the most important of Mythos Busters episodes. It truly is. I I look forward to this episode every year, Mm -hmm. uh, (laughs) mostly because I have to do like the least work of anyone on on this particular topic. And I I just get to (laughs) just get to let your guys wisdom and knowledge flow over me. Mm. Yeah, that's how I like it. Joining as well tonight is Scott. Hey, Scott. Hello. How ready are you? Oh boy, uh, my mind is tired. My my body is tired, but my mind is ready. I, something like that. I am good to go. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And that's, spongy. That's the one. <laughs> also, my favorite episode of the year. So, it's possibly one of it. Oh God, anything but the Seymour episode. Just that one kills me. <laughs> and we've got Justin as well. Hey, Justin. Hey. Sorry that I had to introduce you after sad dog talk. I know that was not not ideal. I mean, low bar. Anything I said was going to bring up the room. Ooh. Yeah, exactly right. Oh, boys. Okay, so we've got uh, a fun episode for you guys tonight. We're going to get through uh, just some normal updates and, and news and, and openers as we do. The main meat of our, to- of our topic. of our Well, I suppose it's the meat of the topic, too. But the, the meat of the episode tonight is going to be our Iron Man planning strategy for this year's Iron Man, which is going to be through the Innsmouth Conspiracy at BusterCon, which you Mm -hmm. should come to if you're not already. And then, of course, we'll round it out with some tentacle time. But before we get to any of that, uh, let's check in, guys. Uh, I know we've been a little busy with other things other than playing Arkham. Uh, Has anyone played Arkham recently? (laughs) Nope. <laughs> I've taken a couple test games on uh, a Luke deck that I was thinking of running, and I have now diverted back to, oh, what did I call it? Completely normal and basic Luke is what I've named the deck. <laughs> <laughs> Just basically, I'm going back to the old 30 good cards standby, um, if you count Barricade and Open Gate as good cards. So, In Luke, I sure do. Yeah, but I was going, uh, my really weird one was... Oh boy, it was it was a fun 
little one. It had uh, Astronomical Atlas, mm-hmm. and the whole thing was running off of uh, using PowerWord and Summon Servitor to essentially work out extra actions, and then using Astronomical Atlas to like double hand it, and then essentially just trying to max out on icons, and so you're just stats balling your Summon Servitor, and you're just drawing a ton of cards, but also committing them beforehand. It was really weird. It it worked okay. Like, it was a decent deck, and it was really fun. Um, but Innsmouth is not the campaign to fuck around, because you will find out. And <laughs> you sure I, will. I just, I don't, I don't trust myself in hour 11 to be piloting this deck at the level it needs to be piloted. And I also don't trust the deck to just not (laughs) fold like a house of cards at the opportune moment. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I've kind of gone back to a very normal slash boring slash comfortable middle-aged suburbanite Luke, you know? (laughs) Is there such a thing? I mean, yeah, he just got his little gate box with his white picket fence and... 2.5 2.5 children. 2. 2 kids. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's it's the Luke in between key parties, right? Yeah. <laughs> the gate box is just the garage. Yeah. <laughs> and well, I mean, was... whore in high gear, that's when he gets his Mustang, right? Midlife crisis mm. and all that. Yeah. Yeah. It's tough to, especially when you've got an idea that you really like, it's really tough to have that conversation with yourself to be like, oh, sorry, kid, you just ain't going to cut it. Yeah. Especially for. Iron Man. Like, I am going to play this yep. Luke Robinson deck, the the, uh, the Atlas one, in another campaign that doesn't, quote-unquote, matter. You know, like, one where I'm just playing for fun and I can jank around, but, you know, Iron Man's serious business. We gotta be, we gotta be serious. Sir. Yes. It's only serious. I'll have, be, I'll have my business socks on. Yep. It's business time. <laughs> Ian, how about you? You been playing at all? Um, I had a good stretch uh, without any Arkham, unfortunately, uh, but in the in the last week or so, I got some games in. Uh, the nice thing about uh, recording a podcast is it's often a motivator for me, like, oh, we're going to record soon, I better play some actual games of uh, the game we're podcasting about. So uh, I picked up my Bob and Mark campaign finally again that I've mentioned on a few podcasts. Um, but they're getting to the point and, and this was a Scarlet Keys campaign. They're getting to the point where they actually have some XP in them. So getting to, to flex and see what those decks can do. Um, so the, the Mark deck is a like gunslinger, um, deck similar to kind of what's been viable for a while with the upgraded 32 Colt, but now with custom modifications I added in. So <clears throat> before this last scenario uh i added some xp into quicksilver bullets on custom modifications which is the one if you succeed by three it deals plus one damage you're doing three with each bullet um it just so happens that mark is pretty good at hitting three or more <laughs> um <laughs> with the extended stock yeah, that's plus two um, and then sometimes I have a beat cop out, so he's hitting with like a base eight a lot of times. Um, so, so with all those pieces together, um, the gunslinger mark was a good time. Um, I was playing through a Scarlet Key scenario. Uh, I don't really want to give scenarios spoilers, but uh, a, a certain boss popped out in a, in a point in a scenario where I had to deal like 10 damage and it was those kind of situations where I just needed to deal it in a single turn. Um, Mm. and, and Mark just like laid out that boss. No problem. 10 damage (laughs) done deal. Um, so yeah, that, that build is a lot of fun. Um, did you end up going a quick draw holster? Um, the plan is to get there. I haven't had the XP for it yet. Um, but that was that was part of the plan is to add that probably with the XP I have now and, and see how that goes. Yeah, Gunslinger Mark is my favorite Mark. Uh, yeah, he's it's it's always my default when I go back. I'm sure there are other builds to explore, but I don't care. Yeah, <laughs> um, and I and I told myself I want to do another uh, true solo Scarlet Keys uh, run at least for a while. <laughs> Um, but I think, as everyone knows, I have a little bit of masochist in me, especially when it comes to Arkham. So, 
<laughs> I, I really wanted to crack it. Um, so I'm trying again, this time with Solo Roland, um, who I think has some... Uh, I just said to myself, like, forget playing the investigators you really want to play. Let's just go back to basics. <laughs> so um, I, I'm trying out Roland. Somewhere who... Nick is seething. Yep. <laughs> That was a, a not so subtle dig towards Nick, but um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I think Roland just has a lot of particular tools for um, Scarlet Keys, and I'm running it with uh, Lex Lee just to get extra pings of damage to expose cards, and so I'm just really going hard to t try to optimize for Scarlet Keys in particular, and throwing everything else out the window, like theme and um interesting cards <laughs> just, just, i just want to win so we'll see how it hap what happens look what you've uh, reduced me to i know <laughs> look what, look what they've done like to me normal boring cards <laughs> I know. this is not who i am um first scenario riddles and rain went well roland just destroyed it but um i've learned that that scenario is not really a good indicator of the rest like i've gotten pretty good at um winning at that scenario it's other scenarios in the campaign that are more troublesome so stay tuned we'll see how it does i'm so ready to like dive at the scarlet keys again once we're <clears throat> once we're through BusterCon. but i am all insmith all the time right now largely because i have switched my deck and justin's deck thrice a piece now <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm, I've been trying to like test out uh, the deck we're, we're, we're having Justin play and the deck I'm going to play. We'll talk about our, our Innsmouth strategies as we go on, but uh, I, I got all the way up through in too deep, and then I was like, oh no, I have to, like, th these are not going to work. We changed our strategy. Uh, I, I'm not playing Tommy. I can't play Tommy. Started Ooh. the whole thing over again. Tried a new Silas build. Um, it was okay. It might work among the whole group, but like it just it didn't feel good to play, and that scared me. So now I now I'd like restarted it again with my tried and true dark horse uh, like sixteen skill Silas, and that's gonna be a lot better. So yeah, just just a lot of Insmith. I'm up to in too deep, and this time I'm seeing it through. Nice. Yeah, I I'm excited to see you play Silas, just because Silas is amazing and. Mm. I, I mean, this kind of feels like it's one of those memes where it's like, oh man, the card pool is really improved for Silas, but you could also insert the names. Uh, Lola, Carolyn, Calvin, like just tons of investigators, right? We're always like, oh mm -hmm. yeah, it's getting better. But I really do think Silas is in a good place right now in the card pool. Silas, <laughs> Silas has good things. Yeah. I'm going to tell you one, one secret that I've learned in my testing so far. Mm-hmm. A cheeky one of of helping hand in Silas is so baller and so worth the deck slot. It's great. Mm. Helping hand, if oh, you recall, yeah. is the yeah. guardian skill that doubles the icons on each other skill committed to the test. And that works so well with Silas's ability if you don't need the boost. It's just like yeah. every time you commit something to completion, it just it juices it. Yeah. It's, yeah. Anyway, anyway looking forward to it yes i'm very much looking forward to mm. uh silas and smith and then i suppose it, it bears uh talking about what, what happened with justin's deck i i have been testing a uh a glyphs amanda that the the idea is that you just kind of like slowly move over locations and then just completely clear them in in one big test or two big tests with the uh the glyphs that let you get an extra clue for every two you succeed by Amanda seems like a good candidate for that. Mm -hmm. And it's working. It, it works. However, the more I've played it, and, and in talking to Justin when he had a chance to actually look at it, I think that might be too much brain burn. Amanda's a lot of mental real estate um, for Iron Man. Yeah. The other night, Sean and I got dinner, and he hands this deck to me to check out. <laughs> and I, I try start... to bring Arkham to restaurants. What of it? We get to see each other in person. It's, you know, uh, and I start flipping through it and I'm like, I'm not even playing Arkham right now. I'm just getting a sandwich and this is too much. <laughs> so I appreciated him confirming that. Yes, that's, that's the call. We'll, we'll move mm -hmm. to something else. 
And that uh, that was it was a fun deck. I, I actually I'm gonna bring that to another campaign down the road. Maybe that'll be my Scarlet Keys. Nope, nope, not no. taking Scarlet Keys. We just we just talked about this. <laughs> anyway, we'll do it some other time. So, we the three of us started talking a little bit, and then a deck that I had played previously in TFA, my Trish Damning Testimony deck, mm-hmm. was the perfect fit for for what we're going to be doing with our overall group strategy and it legitimately pains me that i didn't see that sooner uh because i think i think both scott and ian were like yep that works (laughs) yeah sounds way better than amanda like i i really appreciate amanda and i know uh she can do a lot of like gangbuster things uh but you're right like she is a lot of brain burn and also Mm -hmm. it just makes me a bit nervous that our main Kluver would have an intellect of two. Like, on the turns where you don't get something that's good to put under her, like, just to oh, have a... Oh, I don't build Amanda that way, but I understand your concern. Yeah. I, I've i just been the recipient of bad RNG in shuffling one mm. too many times, and I... It, it makes me nervous, is all I'm saying. So... But I have bent my Luke deck to be a bit more cluey now too which makes me more comfortable with whatever we're going with so yeah and and the trish deck uses janae and damning testimony and in four player it is going to pop so hard because there's just there's almost always going to be an enemy at her location Mm -hmm. uh and when there's not then damning testimony helps her go where it is and yeah it's 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 gonna be a blast so we'll uh i guess we'll talk about that when we actually get to our deck strategies Mm -hmm. lovely uh Ian, what's going on with our patrons? So first off, thanks to our board members. That's Chris B, Chris H, Chris M, Morton, Jared, Ian, Kyle, Philip, Patrick, Abilio, Jesse, Chad, Robert, and Walker. Thanks so much for your huge, huge support of the podcast and everything we do, uh, including a little upcoming convention uh, that's going to be happening very, very like, soon. Like, for real, it, it bears mention, it bears, like, saying again i know we say this every time but the stuff we have planned for buster con and and the the license we had to actually see some of our ideas through to completion mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. is was only possible because of the support we get from our patrons so uh just a genuine thanks to everyone who's subscribed and uh yeah i'm looking looking forward to sharing that back with with people who come to buster con for sure definitely um, and a special shout out to a random patron this time around goes to Alex Mulligan. Thank you, Alex, for your support as well. Um, if you haven't, see the second already... one that you drew. <laughs> I, I mean, I was hoping someone would uh, <laughs> include a Mulligan joke, so thank you. We did it. <laughs> Sorry, Alex. I'm sure you've never heard that joke before. I know, right? Especially being into into card games. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a, a trooper to keep going in the card game world um make sure you check out mythosmerch.com for our sorted merch including um special BusterCon merch um and we do have a few job titles to give out this time around so for this first job title i'm gonna go ahead and throw it over to justin for the first one all right first one is nathan boone thanks nathan your title is Black Market Sales Spam Mailing List Coordinator. Mm. Somebody's got to keep the awful spam addresses off the mailing list so the black market circular gets to the right people, and that's right. you. Mm-hmm. I like it. And Scott, why don't you take the next one? All right, we have uh, Sarkovsky, who is going to be our sarcophagus scrubber for the thing in the sarcophagus. Hmm. Um, that thing gets pretty nasty both inside and out so we got to keep it shiny this one cuts to my soul because i know what it is i'm assuming this is a last name or at least a a play on a last name when you have a last name that ends in ski every nickname you ever have is a riff on it and i get Mm -hmm. yeah (laughs) listen here sweet ass jet ski (laughs) (laughs) shot a brewski swinging a whiskey Mm mm-hmm um and sean why don't you take the last one all right uh our last new hire this time around is going to be victor who is joining the blood cleanup crew specializing in altars daggers and managers keys 
Mm. We'll uh, we'll try to keep the noxious fumes from the cleaning materials at a low. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The manager's keys are are especially hard to clean because they've got small little crevices. You got to take a little brush there. It's it's like painting <laughs> minis, but unpainting minis. <laughs> <laughs> And there's so much blood. <laughs> there's yeah, just I mean, so just... much blood. <laughs> just looks like the shining hallway half the time in the Mythos Busters offices. You'll notice it's a crew. You're joining a crew of blood cleanup. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Man, every time the manager comes up, I, I think about, and I can't remember if Nick said this on the podcast or not, but uh, he was talking about the art brief for the manager from uh, uh excelsior mm -hmm. and he said you know it's 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 got teeth it's you know it's covered in teeth and in his head he's thinking like you know sharp angular triangular teeth and the the thing came back with like rows of molars spread across the body and he's like oh my god that is so much better and creepier <laughs> so every time the manager comes up i just think of its <laughs> molar laden art it's like the nightmare art you get from ai now yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> exactly. Are molars the grossest tooth? I think they are. Yeah. Probably. Okay, top so. three grossest teeth. Go. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> By <Bicuspid. laughs> Teeth power rankings. Yeah. <laughs> the the molar is S tier, I'm telling you. <laughs> we'll just we'll add random teeth to next year's March to Madness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're just a bunch of Pokemon that can only say their name. Incisor! <laughs> Canine! <laughs> Incisor! <laughs> Alright, I'm done. I don't want to see this through, but I love it. Uh, okay, Justin, what news have we before we get to the meat of this thing? You no, know, the only news is about the only thing that matters right now, and that's BusterCon. That's right. Yeah. So, uh, reminder, tickets are on sale through the Game Center. Uh, right now, if you just go out to Google and search BusterCon, you'll you'll land in the right place. Either our website, it's mythosbusters.com slash BusterCon, um, or uh, I believe it's gamezenter.com slash event slash BusterCon. But again, just go search it, and it'll, it'll send you the links. Reminder, the dates are June 1st to June 4th, 2023. If you get the, the ticket for it, you have access to the event space in the back where we will all be. We have a hotel block at the Doubletree. The links are also on our website. It's a nice walking distance. And yeah, there's also an event schedule out there for what, what will be going on other than Iron Man on Saturday and then at other times throughout the con. I think we have, uh, I'll, I'll mention it here, um, but I'm about to put up some details about it on the website in addition to the events going on, uh, one of our board members is actually going to be um, running a library he is calling the Restricted Collection, which is a bunch of fan-made scenarios, challenge scenarios all set up. Uh, it's really cool. It's stuff that uh, is not just standard Arkham, and he will have it where you can basically check out these scenarios, go play them, and bring them back. And so that'll be another cool thing we have. Uh, we hope, we Love hope to that. see we hope to see as many of you there as possible. So yeah, sign up, and uh, we'll see you in June. Hell yeah! And if you are playing an Iron Man, and have yet to sign up for it, uh, it may be close to too late. But I don't think it is. So go out to the website. There's a link, and uh, and sign up for Iron Man. So that way you can get grouped if needed, or at least we can account for your team. Yeah, yep. it's mostly important for people who are uh, singles, doubles, or triples who are looking to fill up to four to mm -hmm. sign up because uh, Josh, the LARP guy, is going to be you, like basically the, the sorting hat and get people into groups. Um, yeah, if you have a team of four, like sign up because we also love to see the team names and we want to see how many people do Iron Man. Uh, it's not as much of a rush, but if you are a solo or a duo, usually looking for a third and fourth and stuff. That's that's important. The sooner you can sign up, the better. And even if you're just not able to make it to BusterCon and playing online or just playing at home, still sign up. We'd love to see how many people are participating mm -hmm. in overall Iron Man as we watch it grow each year. And then one other BusterCon thing before I forget, we did go over a bunch of con stuff on the last episode. So if anyone is just listening to this one and missed that, 
Uh, if you're attending and have thoughts and questions about it, go check that out. So excited. So excited. We so have so excited. much cool stuff. It's going to be a blasty blast. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, uh, the Keystone event of which is going to be Iron Man through the Innsmouth Conspiracy. And I believe, Scott and Ian, you're going to guide us through it tonight. So let's fucking go. <laughs> let's go. Uh, we have a giant spreadsheet again. And yay, uh, we have gone through Innsmouth with a fine tooth comb. Uh, Mr. Trench helped me a lot as well. We got on TTS and just started sorting through stuff. Nice. Um yeah, it was it was daunting. The the all three of us contributed a whole shit ton, and it's Innsmouth has a lot going on. Would you say that is true, Ian? <laughs> it does, um, and I guess we can kind of before we delve into the particulars, just talk about some of like the big things that stick out to us about like what makes Innsmouth different, um, and what like the big high level things we notice. Because yeah, I, I agree. There's a it's it's a weird campaign because there is a lot going on in terms mm-hmm. of this memories mechanic. Um, and a few times when I was trying to track, like, you need to do this in this scenario to unlock this, which then unlocks this, which then it's like a chain reaction of like four different things across four scenarios to unlock one particular memory. Mm-hmm. And that um, hurt my brain a few times when I was trying to <laughs> work mm-hmm. on this on this plan. Um, But the reason I say it's weird is because on the flip side of that, I kind of feel like there's not a lot of decisions or paths compared to other campaigns. Like, do you, did did you notice that as well, Scott? Yeah. One, I guess the feeling that I got, um, I was going through, I got to like scenario six and I'm like, man, like, it just seems like the strategy for each scenario is just do the best you can. (laughs) <laughs> right. you get all the keys right like it just <laughs> do good <laughs> yeah pro tip do better like that is that is the overall strategy <laughs> with Innsmouth. um i'm trying to think of like any big story decisions that there really isn't that much if any yeah, because in the campaign because when you think when you think about like carcosa you have like doubt and conviction of course tfa mm-hmm. you have like the different factions similar with tcu like witches versus um lodge and all that Mm -hmm. good stuff but this one yeah it's just like i mean there's a few little decisions but it's it's like you said more than any other campaign in smith feels like a lot of scenarios are just how much can you do before you die or resign or win um it has a lot of push your luck scenarios um like the classic push your luck scenario to me is midnight masks where it's like how many of the cultists can you unmask before you kind of resign or or yeah or call it quits um and and insmith feels like it has a lot of those where it's just see how much you can do um see how many of those memories you can unlock um and that is kind of interesting for iron man um because as we've often said iron man is finishing is winning uh, but when you have a whole campaign that's built around how much can you do mm-hmm. it kind of makes it tricky of like Iron Man is such a different beast. So how do you make those decisions of like how much to get done? Well, I think the the time constraints of Iron Man is what mm-hmm. makes it difficult because if you like I mean the year we did TCU, what was it like 15 hours? Um, 17 17 hours? Yeah, 17 hours, but we wouldn't have been able <laughs> yeah. to do that in the center. Um but also at the same time we probably would have played a bit faster because we had some technical difficulties and just playing on TTS is a bit slower and you're streaming and all that stuff. Um, Mm -hmm. But it's, yeah, it's, the time makes a big difference. Um, I think Psychopath said it best in chat. I love this. There aren't really paths so much as stretch goals. Mm. Um, (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It's just how much can you get? And the thing too is like, you know, there's this big flashback at the end, flashback 15, which if you get memories one through fourteen, you achieve which everyone like. I mean, that is the quote unquote real ending, um, but it's it's an epilogue, right? Yeah. And mm-hmm. the thing is, too, if you miss any one of those memories at any point in the in the campaign, you can't get it. And so there's six scenarios, sorry, five scenarios where you basically have to play perfect. And if yes. you 
if you stumble or fumble <laughs> or whatever, it's like, well, now you can just give up on every other memory, except for the ones that have, like, slight gameplay implications and, stuff, and, and XP and bonus. But, I mean, it's, you know, you shoot for the moon, but you might land among the stars, you know? So. <laughs> yeah, it's... And... It's tough because with all that in mind, I feel like this is the scenario I'm most worried about time-wise. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, TCU is a beast like we talked about, but it was at home. So, you know, the only thing that's really hurt is our bodies and minds after 17 yeah. hours. <laughs> but but when we're doing it in person, there's a finite time like everything is open. So um, when you have those like stretch goals, I like that way the way of phrasing it. Um, I feel like more than any other campaign, everyone, ourselves included, are going to have to be very conscious of, like, how much time are we spending on each scenario? Like, okay, we've spent, like, an hour and a half on this scenario. Like, do we want to keep going? If we keep going at this pace, are we going to finish in time? So, nope, scuttle it, the boat. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so some of those decisions, it's... It's gonna be two. It's gonna be like two competing things. Like, oh, how well are we doing? Should we resign? And then, how much time are we taking on this scenario? Should we resign? Well, shall we dive into it? <laughs> yeah. Yes. <Yeah. Let's> go. <laughs> dive. Uh, yeah. Okay. Let's pit of despair. Nice and deep. <laughs> um. So I guess there's there's a few things. Um. The way the way we organize this spreadsheet just to give everyone kind of an idea a mental note of um what we're going through so we have a scenario and there's a couple like uh treachery cards that i made columns for like we want to know if there's ancient evils in the scenario right like this is going to be something we reference like right before we set the scenarios like is there ancient evils or like can we actually count the doom um is there the deep one assault slash the deep one bull in this scenario because that that whole set can just ruin your day that fucker yeah oh He's our nemesis, Ian. The um, the, in- the entire campaign. Yep. <laughs> Unless I power word him, because he is a very helpful ally. Ooh. Um, there is a, and this happened um, at Return to Dunwich Iron Man at Arkham Knights. Uh, what was that treachery that we always planned for, where you had to? Baleful pick? welcome. Yes. Um, there's one in this campaign, Syzygy. So Mm. it's peril, revelation, you must choose one. Each investigator loses three resources. Each investigator takes two horror. Or place one doom on the current agenda. This effect can cause the current agenda to advance. So essentially ancient evils. Which is, yeah. It's a card we want to talk about before each mythos phase. And then uh, jump scare locations, there's a lot of hidden stuff here, so just be aware Like when you're going into a location without knowing what it is, uh, do you need to be careful of certain things, and then just tactics for each scenario. So Pit of Despair. Quite a tough opening scenario. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. The plan is to just find the locations you need to and get out. (laughs) There's not really a a plan per se is this the hardest opening scenario of a campaign you think it it might be only because I of mean, the rng involved yeah the rng suck i mean you remember the untamed wilds right <laughs> um yeah untamed wilds is tricky um current calls can still be tricky this one's this one can be absolutely brutal though Especially when you're like me and like the underground rivers always end up immediately next to each other <laughs> and therefore are completely useless. Yeah, this is I, I think the difference between this and Untamed Wild, like I think I feel like they're about the same difficulty, except that Pit of Despair adds the RNG map. Like at least in uh, Untamed Wilds, you could you knew where locations were going to be. Oh sure. To me. So it's not in what order they'd appear. Yeah. But you could, you knew if you were exploring from this location, it's only going to connect to one of these other two or something. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Whereas Pit of Despair, you're just wandering around in darkness and hitting your head against the wall. <laughs> well, this one's so hard uh, because if you kind of fumble or, or, or move too slowly at the beginning, like the, the water yeah. level rising can really catch up to you. Mm-hmm. And in four-player, we'll also have the treachery that 
uh, raises water level of a specific mm. location as a treachery more often. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a feeling we're going to have to be moving around fully flooded locations in four player a lot more than I'm used to. That Okay. Has anyone actually played Innsmouth four player yet? Not I. No. I ha not I've me. only played it two player. Okay. <laughs> this is gonna be yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That that's like my one pause where I'm like, okay, I've I've played this and managed this campaign two player and one player, but yeah, like you mentioned, Sean, some of those treacheries that they're fine when you see them what, like f you know, four or five, six times throughout a game, but when you get on four player and you're just gonna chain them and see them over and over again. Mm -hmm. And it's a little this dicey. encounter deck is a tight encounter deck. It is. It is not big. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean and... to scare y'all, but y'all should be oh, scared a little. Yeah, it should be scared. <laughs> um, and uh, Scott called out like the jump scare um, locations that we put in the spreadsheet because one of the big things you have to keep in mind um, with the locations and the flooding. Um, the reason we're calling them jump scares because like they have these reveal effects that suddenly flood it when you weren't expecting it and whoops all of a sudden you're jumping into a fully flooded location so um it's actually a campaign any any of the scenarios where you're dealing with flooding which pit of despair is a, a big initial one that that last turn if you're planning to move um you can't just move willy-nilly you need to know kind of like am i drowning do i need to get to a safe location and if not where am i going to end up and just you just kind of have to be aware of what that next location could possibly be another um column i have here is the auto fail treacheries which were a specific set of treacheries it's shattered memories is the name of the encounter set um that show up quite a few times during this campaign and it's um i'll kind of go over them uh because they're in this scenario uh, macabre, me macabre Memento. Uh, Revelation tests three willpower. If you reveal a cultist token during this test, you automatically fail. If you fail, take two horror. Um, fractured Consciousness. So you test three intellect. If you reveal a tablet token, you automatically fail. And if you fail, you take two damage. And Memory of Oblivion. Test four will or four intellect. If you reveal an Elder Thing token, you automatically fail. For each point you fail by, which would be four if you auto-failed, choose and discard a card from your hand. That set is so brutal. Like, it is just back-breaking. Like, it just... The amount of, like, boom, you take two of damage or horror, or boom, discard half to all of your hand. It just It's something we need to be aware of in... in I think it's three scenarios, and it's just it. Those are so potent. You you yep. just got to be aware. And we've seen it happen before in in high count multiplayer, where for some reason, RNG just decides that one person is getting that same treachery. Yeah. The whole game, and mm -hmm. <laughs> that's a problem. Yeah, and the bag starts with two of each of those tokens. So I mean. <sighs> I, I, I think it's a 19... But don't you love three auto, feel, eight, auto fails in the Right? <laughs> in <that laughs> three, one. three auto fails on a test, which is like one in seven or one in six. Like one in six and a point five on this test that you are going to discard four cards from your hand. Just, oh my God. <laughs> right? Like roll a D6. If you roll one, discard four. Yeah. Is the, is the argument on that, so... And then when you combine those ones that deal like damage and horror, um, kind of with good chances of taking those, uh, with some of the enemies um, that we have to deal with. So one of the big things in Innsmouth that's worth talking about in Pit of Despair, because this is the case with the whole campaign, is these engage effects that mm -hmm. all the Deep One enemies have. Um, they all have, like the bread and butter ones that show up again and again are the ones that when they engage you deal a damage when they engage you deal a horror uh, but then there are other ones you know like the uh, the bull that discards a card from hand um, there's some other annoying ones in later scenarios that we'll talk about um, but the main point just is just that you. 
that it's just like so much damage and horror. So the first thing that I thought about um, when looking at Ensmith is just like soaks. Like you have to be prepared to take a lot of damage and horror. That's just what it's gonna do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So strategy for uh, Pit of Despair is to just get out. There's not really a strategy. Just get the clues, spread out till you find the exit. Get the keys. Don't die. Solid. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, it is really like we talked about um, one of the the push your luck scenarios where there are three memories that you can unlock. Four, um, I think. Yeah. What one of them you get just from completing Act One, which hopefully we'll get that far. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then there's three that you get from various locations. So. Um, Pit of Despair is really going to be... There's not so much strategy as, like, how hard are we going to go for those three memories? Um, mm-hmm. And then also victory points, because um, this is potentially a scenario we can get some victory points. But, yeah, I, I, I do predict we're going to be having that conversation of, like, should we uh, just finish up the scenario or should we push for these memories and victory points? The thing, too, is if we push for the end and just kind of ignore a memory, then we are no longer going for the the best and or quote unquote full ending Mm -hmm. yeah which like the fact that you miss one year out just make it's gonna make me sad i just know it (laughs) yeah i feel like we should try a bit to go for that like Mm -hmm. and it it, i mean it gets us xp it gets us good thing in scenarios Mm -hmm. and you know it's thematic and we'd love to do it but push come to shove especially time um or someone's gonna die Sorry, like a win is a win, especially when you get the investigator win the campaign with the exclamation mark. Like the epilogue yeah. is just an epilogue, so yeah, yeah. I think we ju- we just have to balance the gameplay and the time so much differently than in previous ones. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean that's not anything new. We've said it in different ways, but I almost feel like we need to have a timer running on each of these so we know roughly where we're at. Because mm-hmm. if we're just looking at the clock, it's oh well, what time is it? That's different to then have to do the math of how much time we spent versus we are past the hour point. What are we going to do? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I feel like it's going to be a little bit top heavy where we are really pushing in the early scenarios. And if we ever miss like a memory along the way, then we're probably just going to be in the mode of at that point. We can kind of cruise control maybe on time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. But, I mean, some of these memories have gameplay effects. Like, each of the memories in Pit of Despair remove a bad stuff token, Mm -hmm. um, which is not bad at all, given what we just talked about with these annoying auto-fail treacheries based on bad stuff. Um, And then some of them, like the battle with the horrifying devil, means that you can kill the big terror enemy later, uh, which is probably something we would want to have available. So Definitely one of one. So yeah i i think that's like the main one that's important but yeah. we'll try for them all I'm, I'm sure yeah so yeah there's uh three resolutions you're either defeated you doom out and in each of those you get a trauma and you get your xp and move on uh or you find the exit and unlock it um and you need the green key from the altar of dagon and in order to get the green key you need the blue key or three keys and eight clues at the altar to get the green key so you need to like daisy chain keys and stuff like that so yeah look forward to a trauma first scenario okay (laughs) uh (laughs) we move on to the interlude uh one xp per memory up to four uh and you get the effects that we talked about so removing various tokens from the bag we get on to midnight masks 2.0 Vanishing of Alina Harper. Don't you mean Prancing Pony? <laughs> yeah. Sure, yeah. Sure do. Yep. It's always Johnny Goblin Fingers. <laughs> yep. Yeah. For uh, me, Johnny Goblin Fingers is Othera Gilman. Hmm. Just throwing that mm. out there. It's it's always Othera for me. I don't know if there's one that shows up more for me. Maybe. So, Vanishing Alina Harper. Um... Again, another scenario where it's just kind of do as best as you can and make mm-hmm. sure you make a guess on time and try not to not be bad at guessing. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I have to ask, like, when, as we're talking strategy for this one, mm-hmm. has anyone mm-hmm. actually, like, run numbers on the best way to look at the leads deck? Yes. Is it always t- to maximize it? It is on the first time you want to look at one card. The second time okay. you want to work at two cards. The third time and forever on you want to do three. Okay. I dig that. So here's the. So <laughs> we were talking, and I, I kind of realized that in my strategy of playing this game, uh, this scenario in the past, rather, I almost never select the. the enemies out of the leads deck mm-hmm. i will always pick a location over Same. one of the enemies yeah mm-hmm. to the point where you know because again i've only played this in two player maybe that's that's kind of the difference is i almost never have a suspect out there that's not the one that you know you you get at the end hmm. the real one so that'll be interesting yeah and one thing yeah uh big in the chat locations have a vp enemies have none but they still why is that zero i have no idea um, if you do kill a suspect, you don't need to. Uh, they come back in scenario three and scenario seven. Yeah, they come back There's out just from no blood. Point. So it's like the opposite of the the dinner party in Carcosa. Like <laughs> in there, if you kill them all, you're good. Here, if you kill them, they get angry at you. So the op- opposite. Yeah. Yeah. Generally, the locations are better. But yeah. Um, and there, there's also some of the locations that help you. Uh, with the lead stack, like they have effects that help you filter or remove cards from the lead stack, so mm-hmm. that can be helpful as well. Uh, but yeah, again, like Scott said, there's not really like a, a big choice to make or um, some clever strategy other than I think the the strategy just does really boil down to the lead stack and how you manage that at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. A couple key things here. We got the Innsmouth look that reduces your your sanity. Um, that's one thing too in a few of these scenarios. The There's a lot of treacheries that reduce your total sanity. So if you mm. only have yep. one or two remaining, it can just straight up kill you. Um, and I'll, like, I'll mention this in Into Deep, the next scenario. It has both Dreams of Rilia and Innsmouth mm-hmm. look. So there's six, like four, four to six treacheries in the deck that can just be minus one sanity, and that can just outright kill you. So you have to be very, very careful about how you manage your sanity in this campaign. Yeah, and again, because it's four player, you're drawing through the encounter deck faster. Um, gonna see those more. So again, that's where the soaks came in, and just and but with that in mind, especially like you should never be. I mean, if you can help it, of course, but. You should never be at a situation where you're like one horror away. Like you need a little bit of a buffer because of those treacheries. Mm-hmm. Hunting shadows in this one too. Yep. And false so. le- false leads. So probably no. everyone wants to have a clue oh. or two handy. I hate false leads. <laughs> yeah. Thankfully, you can lose just one clue to false leads. So if everyone could just hold onto one clue and just the cluvers can do the rest, I guess. All right. I call the the. Is it the shoreward slums that has one shroud? Something like that. Something like that. Yeah, all yours. Lovely. Uh, and we do want to try and get the location, because that allows us to get the black key in scenario three. So if we don't find mm-hmm. the correct location, we can't do the uh, epilogue. Because you God need to get... damn. Yeah, like, seriously. Innsmouth, you crazy. <laughs> yeah. So... One one thing too, I actually forgot to mention this. I went through and put in a couple uh, key cards, maybe for scenarios. In the first one, um, I'm out of here is really good because you just need the resign action, uh, and pocket telescope for looking at face down stuff. Uh, in Alina Harper, or her, sorry, the vanishing of Alina Harper, uh, fine clothes is pretty. Fan- There's a lot of parlay tests. Open gates are going to be clutch in uh, a couple scenarios i imagine yeah and as far as um the tr- the encounter deck there's no autofill treacheries there's no deep one assault there's no ancient evils and there's no syzygy so yay it's it's okay it's not terrible and uh Beautiful. there's a ton of different endings and uh we want to try and get the mission was successful which requires both but i mean that's probably not going to happen 
because I, uh, <laughs> yeah just how these things scale in four player is such a mystery to me that's causing me yeah. no small amount of anxiety <laughs> <laughs> right i mean it can go both ways um one of the other big elements of Innsmouth that I think about in addition to a bunch of horror and damage you have to soak up in these memories is um, the big maps. Like Innsmouth has a lot of big map locations um, mm. and it's one thing that makes solo a little bit difficult in certain situations, uh, certain scenarios. So in four player, like part of my brain is like, oh, we'll be able to cover all these maps in a way that we can't in lower player accounts. Uh, but the flip side of that is also the encounter deck is going to be comboing us much more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Pocket Telescope. Yeah, like Big Goodman is saying in chat, like it it came up a couple times when I was going through this uh, campaign. Like there's a lot of face down, randomized stuff. Um, Pocket Telescope is a pretty, pretty good card for this campaign if you're able to sneak it into your deck somewhere. So, did you? Mm hmm. Uh, I'm close to having Mr. I can be connected to any location from which to use it oh no because gatebox is only connected to revealed locations Ah, okay, so it's yeah, not as correct. like it's not crazy good in Luke it's just normal yeah. good in Luke so. alright I rescind my snarky tone <laughs> as you should there are no memories to get here but we do need to get the location to get the black key to get the memory in in too deep uh, the interlude happens, and if the mission is successful, we get Alina Harper. So, good Woo. luck to us. Uh, in too deep. Have we decided who's going to get uh, Thomas and Alina, assuming Oof. we get to make that decision? <laughs> I don't think we've talked about it. Because Alina, what does she do? She's the, the punchy one. She, the first thing you do doesn't uh, provoke an attack of opportunity. Right. So she's really, she's really soak and uh, intellect agility boosts. Yeah. So probably Trish. Yeah. I think that's a Trish cost, play all the way. Cost four. Oh. I mean, in solo, I can absolutely see her, see her ability being good, but. Mm -hmm. She's so good with Trish. I've had her with Trish, and it's ridiculous. Well, I suppose with Trish in particular, that's that's the thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Thomas has right. reaction after an enemy attacks and investigate your location, even if the attack was canceled. Exhaust them. Draw a card. And a willpower and combat boost. Probably one of the fighters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah. No, I'll give it to you. Luke. Can have him. No. <laughs> I don't know if I'm willing to uh, charisma just for just for him though. So, mm -hmm. yeah, especially because they pop in and out of your deck. Mm hmm. Like they just yeah. Tis annoying. In too deep. Got the barricades. Cause I'm in too deep. <laughs> yeah. uh, the strategy for this one is surprising no one. Uh, do as best as you can. <laughs> what? Yeah, yeah. It's Get ground to the end. Yeah. <laughs> So I was just talking to Nick about this one. Uh, he came to visit recently, and we were talking about Iron Man. And he said last time he played this, he played it the normal way, and then he kind of thought to himself, like, what happens if you just, like, really beeline? And apparently, you can just, like, jet straight to the end if you're not soaking up memories. So if we've already screwed the pooch on getting the epilogue by this mm -hmm. point, uh, we could potentially make in too deep uh, a pretty quick scenario. Mm-hmm. Assuming we so can get I'm through told. there. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he probably forgot a rule. <laughs> <laughs> Did he forget the scenario exists? That would never happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he does have memories of it, at least. So. Yeah. Uh, so there is the Deep One Assault and the Deep One Bull and mm -hmm. Syzygy in this one. So. Yeah, and the Deep One Assault can be particularly bad in this one because this is the infamous murder ball scenario where yep. if you're not killing enemies as they appear, which often you're just trying to make a run for it, um, you just tend to get this big ball of enemies with Hunter that follows after you, um, which is fine if you can keep ahead of them, um, but often you can leave Deep One Assault out of your calculations and then all of a sudden... Um, they're able to run at you and engage you. 
Uh, and there's also a particular bad stuff token in this scenario that I made note of for In Too Deep, which is the cultist. It's a minus two, but if you fail, move to the connecting location to the east, ignoring oh. all barriers. Oh. Uh, that one has hurt me badly in the past, so I think it's worth everyone noting that uh, be pr if you're going to take a test, make sure you're at least two up, um, unless you're prepared to move to the east suddenly. <laughs> mm hmm you know what my the, the, this scenario is basically my shining moment because my first experience in this deck after getting upgraded Peter Peter Sylvester uh is going to be to grab the explosive trap upgrade from makeshift trap and I I'm already going to have net mm -hmm. so I'm going to have a thing that freezes yes. enemies and then blows them up so I'm really hoping that uh dropping that behind us is going to be clutch I'll also have barricade so ooh yeah yeah that yeah we both have that's four copies of a closed door on the murder ball so love it yeah uh yeah you we try and get out and <laughs> uh if we get out uh we get to their vehicles on time and so i believe that one if we don't get to our vehicles we just add a doom in the next st scenario okay I'm pretty sure, which is not crazy bad. Um, a couple of the jump scare locations. We got the railway station. Uh, you have to chest or sorry, test agility uh, or take damage. Um, jump scare locations. Yeah. <laughs> is um, that a thing? That's what yeah, I mean. Should... That's what I call them. Is basically the locations that like be mm -hmm. aware when you enter this location, something happens that yeah, you need to be. I'm into it. Yeah. I mean, it's like, a thing now. Yeah. It, it, <laughs> like I'm. I'm going to continue the meme if no one else will. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. First National Grocery, you put up a barrier from whence you came. So first person in, <laughs> a barrier closes behind them. And then Innsmouth Square, uh, it spawns an exhausted Shogath there. So, um, What I I uh, triggers the, the mob again? Is it if the mission isn't successful or if you got one of the accusations wrong? What, what, what triggers that? believe it's if the mission is not successful okay or there's someone out for blood i think it might be out for blood yeah because don't you it. isn't the mob one of the things you have to do and so you would want to not fail earlier or am well, i doesn't the mob get wrong? a key yeah i think they do after Agenda Two, after Agenda Two, Angry Mob spawns with a key at Innsmouth Square. Yeah, they do okay. get a key. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, Great. And and the reason why that matters is because one of the memories you need seven keys at Sawbone Alley. Seven keys. Um, everything else is pretty reasonable in my experience. Like the other memories, two keys at the square, five keys mm -hmm. at bookshop, whatever. Those are all doable. Um, the black key, like we talked about, is based on. Uh, the vanishing scenario location um but having seven keys um you really need to be getting all of them including um the one from the mob so that makes it a little bit difficult uh a lot of these memories again it depends on if we're trying to go for all of them um compared to some of these memories a lot of these ones don't necessarily unlock stuff later they're just useful now like there's the Joe Sargent memory, which gives you Joe, who lets you move around, which can be pretty useful, but it's not its not something that's going to come up later. Um, but there are some good effects. Like, if you do get the seven keys one, it adds a plus one to the bag. Which mm -hmm. is oh, that's nothing right. To, nothing to sneeze at there. Yep. God, who uh, would do that as a campaign reward? That's ridiculous. Yeah, oh, I know. That's so unbalanced. <laughs> <laughs> it's just break the game why don't you yeah uh if you get a jailbreak then you get to remove a bad token of your choice one of the like the symbols so mm -hmm. um one key uh treachery i want to bring up for this one okay so there's the two i talked about insmith look and dreams of Rilia, which will drop your sanity so just be careful uh and then we have pulled back uh, which is a willpower test, and if you fail it, you move east back through the barriers, <sighs> which is similar to the cultist. It just it sends you back. So it just, oh man, if you failed that with a cultist token, 
<laughs> you go two layers back? Yeah, you you could potentially go all the way back, can't you? Oh boy. So, uh, hey, Scott, mulligan hard for your open gates and yes. pop one on the starting location, hopefully. Yep. Yeah, the open gates are going to be basically um, like lifesaver rafts, <laughs> I think, yep. in this one. Um, it's also something to bring up, too. Like, if if people can clear out the location of clues, I mean, Justin, this is mostly you and me, is if Luke can take all the keys, because when we have all seven, I can gate box back to the location, the Sawbone Alley or whatever. If everyone else is, like, we, we get ready to win the scenario... And then Luke just goes, whoop, back to Sawbone, get the memory, whoop, back to the exit, and we go. Love that. So. I can absolutely, true. I can absolutely kelp with the keys. Yeah, and then there's uh, Furtive Locals, which I know when I was looking through. That's the one that prevents parlaying, right? Yeah, so we, because there's so much parlaying in this scenario and the, the disappearance of Alina Harper... We want to try and keep furtive locals out of play as best we can. Because if you succeed, you either take a damage or put furtive locals into play. If you fail, you do both. Um, and kind of the, the thing I'm thinking is even if you succeed, you take that damage. Because, I mean, we can talk about it in the moment. Like, if we don't need parlay that round. But you're usually going to need parlay. And at the end of the round, we only discard one copy of Fur of Locals from play. Like, it's max one per round. So if we have three in the display, it's three turns of no parlaying, which is where you start to get uh, into dangerous scenarios of not being able to finish the scenario because of the lack of ability to parlay. So just something we want to keep in mind. But yeah, and key cards for this, any movement or teleportation tricks. So... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which, which movement is good <laughs> i have both track shoes and nimble in my deck so i'm really hoping to be zippy in this one beauty i totally forgot we have luke in our back pocket now i feel a lot better about getting that uh seven <laughs> key memory <laughs> <laughs> yeah it is a yep. it is a full action to transfer key to somebody which is really action intensive but i mean like if it's just one or two keys like if luke has five of them and they you know someone else has grabbed one or two like that that's fine it's just i don't think we want to spread them out evenly among the team and then try and get them all to luke for that scenario but so we basically want to r1 this scenario uh if we don't we take a trauma and mm -hmm. if we doom out insmith gets consumed by a rising tide which we seems, don't want seems fine yeah it's probably bad <laughs> or good who knows then we move on to the scenario that everyone loves because mm -hmm. of how well you can plan for it. Mm -hmm. Devil Devil Reef. Mm -hmm. Which is RNG on RNG. And <laughs> yep. There's uh Hope you like RNG. Yeah. <laughs> um you need to grab two keys and some clues from certain locations and bring those to certain other locations and those ones can be all over the map and everyone has to take the boat and it's slow and cumbersome who oh boy what a scenario yeah. <laughs> yeah there's like the um locations that you need to unlock each of these um what would you call them like relics items these special yeah, items relics. we're trying to get relics um but those locations are each randomized as well so like the color combination of keys you need you can't plan for either mm -hmm. so yeah yeah you can't really plan for anything it's just you have to get as many keys as you can uh but the other thing that's useful for this location uh for this scenario that i've found in the past and again um luckily we have the investigators that we do is uh, just going out and scouting the map early. Um, mm -hmm. Like having someone do a lot of scouting, I think is generally just good for this scenario so that you know what you need instead of just like kind of stumbling along and figuring out as you go. Yeah, the, um, the, the way I kind of envisioned turn one, because you, you get essentially 18 turns in this, in this scenario 
Um, there's no Syzygy, there's no Ancient Evils, so you get the full 18. Um, is, so what I have written down is, turn one, drop Luke off at an island, and then, because Luke can gate box and whatever, right? Like, just leave Luke at an island, he'll be fine. <laughs> and then drive to the next island, and then drop team two off, um, which I think could be uh, Trish and either of our killers. And then the third action is the drive of the boat. So either uh, Ian or Sean, like you pick who wants to go to an island by themselves. Um, and you can scout over there. And then Luke can try and get the gate or the, the open gates out to start moving between islands without doing the three action thing. Um, and then turn two through 18, I have fucking figure it out written down. <laughs> so you just got to do that. And try and kill the terror if you can. And Ian, with you bringing the the sniper build, I think we talked about this in our chat, which I realized if you're standing on any of the ocean locations, which is the middle location, or any of the five prongs of the the map, I guess, um, and you have the the ranged gun with a scope on it, uh, you can hit every other location in the entire game. Mm-hmm. So. <laughs> Seems, Seems good. Seems good to me. Yeah. <sighs> this is the one that makes me nervous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is this is the first one that really has a well, that's not quite true. Some of the other scenarios have kind of like little mini bosses like the uh Into Deep has a kind of bigish, two bigish enemies, I guess, and the Pit of Despair has amalgam, but this one has the terror, which is like kind of a big boss that we have to deal with yeah and lots of locations come in half are fully flooded so we have to be careful with that um any teleportation tricks uh is really handy and then we get we get to fight the chibi kraken don't we Mm Hmm. yeah Yeah, the chibi (laughs) kraken yes That's, the, that's perfect. That's the new uh <laughs> psychopath just made the same joke. Excuse me, boys. I think you mean the Kawhi de- the Kawhi of Devil Reef. <laughs> it's very Kawhi. Yeah. Uh there are a couple treacheries that I, w- is worth keeping in mind in Devil Reef that like mess with vehicle use. Um that the treacheries that always stick in my brain are the ones that I remember have cost me a game in the past and caused me mm-hmm. to lose. Uh, but there's like dragged under where it gets put in your threat area. If you're in a vehicle, you have to leave it and you can't enter vehicles and you have to test combat or agility to get rid of it. Um, and then there's malfunction, which attaches to the vehicle itself and you can't use the action abilities on, on the boat. Um, and you have to test intellect to get rid of those. Um, so thankfully, hopefully in four player, we should have the extra actions we need to take care of those and like nail those tests since we can help each other with those, but it's just worth knowing they exist when you're planning out your turns. One thing too about this scenario is if we get to this scenario and we maybe missed a memory or two, we know we're not going for the epilogue. Um, and we are not too concerned about the, uh, gameplay uh, things that we can get for this. Um, it's basically we get some of the idols, which they're handy, but they're not needed. Um, but they are good. They're they're good. Yeah, some of them are. Um, this is a scenario where we can just be like, you know what, we're just going victory point hunting, and we'll just when we get tired, we'll go back to the middle and resign. So if we have so. a repeat of the witching hour from TCU, where we played the first scenario of the campaign for like two and a half hours. And had to do an audible uh, halfway through. Yeah. (laughs) Man. Yeah. So they're good, but uh, I don't, I also don't want to risk the entire campaign time wise on this scenario. Seems reasonable. Um, It's also, (laughs) it's also, we can, we can resign first turn. It's one of those locate, one of those um, (laughs) things. Like it's just, just an option. I'm just saying it, it has to be just mentioned immediately that is, available it is available <laughs> bye yeah. yeah yeah i this will probably be the longest scenario of the campaign or at least can be if you're really pushing for it so 
yeah it's worth it's worth keeping in mind like this is the kind of scenario that can spiral out of control in terms of time if you're not careful sure can yeah i think this is definitely one we basically set a timer and then have mm-hmm. maybe two follow-up timers at the end if you hit x time and it's yeah okay we gotta make a decision then you have one more timer of okay it's close and third one you just gotta pull the plug yeah yeah it's gonna hurt but yeah it's the good of the campaign yeah Mm -hmm. yep and yeah there's three memories in there and then yeah then we move on to horror and high gear which, if Luke pulls Barricade in his opening hand, which I will hard mulligan for, <laughs> uh, this basically turns the scenarios off. I'm sorry if you wanted to play a scenario here. It's not going to happen. You just take a scenic drive around Innsmouth. It's cool. Yeah, just a nice Sunday drive. Um, so basically the way it starts is there's that road, right? And you have um, three locations lined up. The leftmost has enemies at it. Uh, then you have an empty location. Then you have the location where we're at. Uh, and Luke can basically play barricade at that second location, and almost all the enemies enemies spawn at the leftmost location, and so they would just spawn in that location that they can't move from, and they just sit there, just revving their engines, <laughs> as we just drive leisurely by. So, can't wait. Sounds this scenario is like also <laughs> like there's no choice in it, right? Like you either get to the end or you don't. Um, yep. <laughs> when we would like to get Ooh. to the end psychopath points out pocket telescope another clutch pocket yes. telescope for this scenario oh, yeah it's huge. <laughs> it's ridiculous in this if someone scenario. can find room for it i would yeah. but i can't take it <laughs> how convenient yeah um <laughs> <laughs> yeah it, it this scenario like if, if we get barricade and pocket telescope we basically just i mean we hacked ourselves outside the map at some point <laughs> so yeah, I mean, the listeners have heard us talk about certain cards over and over, which is just the clue that those cards are really good for those cam- this campaign, Pocket Telescope and Open Gate specifically. Oof. Yeah, so good. <laughs> There's no memories in this one. Um, I don't think... Uh, there is Ancient Evils, and there is the Auto Fails. This one also mm-hmm. chucks out a lot of auto damage. This scenario there's a lot of treacheries that just throw stuff at you and it's yeah it's even though we'll have the enemies blocked off hopefully uh if i get barricade um it's still gonna be iffy uh as far as drivers we want high willpower or high agility preferably both um, but i don't think we really have someone with both although sean i will yeah you'll have when i have yeah. When I have Dark Horse and Peter Sylvester online, I'll have yeah four willpower and like six or seven agility. <laughs> Silas, take the wheel. Although we will be spread out <laughs> among a couple cars, so yes, yeah. we'll yeah. need a cu- we'll need two drivers. Yeah, yeah. So. yeah the, it, it's a fairly straightforward scenario because you're yeah you're just driving from point A to point B. Um, there's one big jump scare location, which is the cliffside road. Mm-hmm. Um, where that's where those driver stats come into play, where you test will or agility. Um, and if you fail, then the ve- vehicle's removed from the game, and each investigator in that vehicle takes 10 damage. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's not nothing. I have crashed before, um, thanks to an auto fail. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, it's just something worth planning for or thinking about, but... You know what that um, says to me, though? That says to me, with my deny five, uh, heal all the damage on you and <laughs> keep playing. <laughs> so, Are you actually going to take deny five? I mean, okay, so one thing about my deck list is I am taking both, uh, oh goodness, where is it? Arcane, research, research, and down the rabbit hole. So I'm getting an extra four XP every scenario. Um, which over the course of the scenario or the campaign, um, I'm going to get an extra 28 XP of effectively usable XP because you don't like the final scenario doesn't matter. Um, so yeah, I'll probably get to nine five at some point. <laughs> yeah. Looking forward to that. It's a great card. Mm-hmm. It, uh, saved your butt in TFA. I remember that much. Sure did. Oof. 
Oh, that was an Iron Man for the books. <laughs> Anything else about horror in high gear? I mean, I feel like it's like the simplest scenario in this this one. Yeah, especially I, I if mean, we can just negate it. Yeah. Like, if worse comes to worse and we did uh, lose, then we take trauma and it's one starting doom on the next scenario, which, not ideal, but not the end of the world either. Yeah. Which, one of the things you'll notice in every, like, pretty much every scenario resolution we've mentioned so far has been, like, if you lose, you take trauma, but keep going. Um, So one of the big things that I notice about Innsmith is... Um, compared to some of the other uh, campaigns we've dealt with where we were like really worried about certain scenarios like uh, Unspeakable Oath, for example, or some of those like early campaign um, scenarios that can just cause you to lose the whole campaign. Innsmouth doesn't have any of those. It only has one scenario that can cause a campaign loss, and that's the next one we're going to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> Not with, not with Daddy Silas in the pump room. Let me tell you what. <laughs> pump, 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 pump you up. Uh, so a light in the fog. Um, this is where you are on the surface, all calm and ready. And then you go down into the caves and there's a whole bunch of stuff and there's rooms flooding and you have to find your way out and you also have to pump your way out. You have to make sure it's... it's fully unflooded um priority one is to get the lantern room key back to the falcon point cliffside so you have to go basically into the map grab the key and go back to almost the starting location um this gets you a memory you get to remove a bad stuff token of your choice you get uh four clues in 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 four player um and you get a yeah a memory for that so it's a pretty good one and then, after that, uh, we want to deal with Marsh to unlock the basement. And uh, once you unlock the basement, the clues just let you peek at different uh, locations. So you basically want to explore these locations. It comes in, there's like three rows of four each. And they're randomized except for one column down the middle that's essentially the staircase between the things. Um, the key thing, though, is all the locations on the same row are connected. And I can't tell you how many times I have miscounted how long how my movement works. Because you can go all the way from the left side to all the way to the right side in one action. Because they're all connected. Yep, I've messed that so, up, too. <laughs> yep. I don't know a player yep. who hasn't. Hundred percent, hundred percent did that. Yeah, because that's not normally how connections work. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's also you can. There's a chance of going to jail in this one, and someone else, or you can try and break out, or someone else can try and help break you out. Uh, I believe it is a agility and combat test, and or combat test. Sounds right. There's a whole bunch of locations that have keys. And then you have to get them to their special location that match that key to get uh, memories and XP and stuff like that and get the, um, what do you call them, the relics. Oh, yeah, good. and we mentioned that this is like uh, the scenario where you can have a campaign loss. Um, but that's actually, it, it's kind of weird because um, if you lose in the first three agendas of the scenario you're fine um but if you lose in agenda four that's when your campaign is over which is when you get in the the basement flooding part um so it's it's almost like if you're gonna lose you want to do it early (laughs) Um, if you make it to the end you want to win at that point which i mean the the sounds dumb to say because of course you want to win but it's just kind of one of the weird things about this scenario that like if you are going to lose or let's say resign like it's something you want to do early on um and if you think you're like not in a good position headed towards the last agenda you you might want to x yourself out early of the scenario before you get to that point so i think yeah once we hit agenda three i think we need to take like stop when we hit agenda three and just 
look at ourselves and be like, are we going to be able to finish this or do we need to VP hunt and then die? Um, because the resigning point at Falcon Point Gatehouse leaves at one point. Yep. And so there's no resigning. Like now you're locked in. So this is also a first turn resign if we need to. Um, it would suck to not get the dive suits um, Ooh, and yeah. get the XP and all that stuff. But I mean, this is this can be a lengthy scenario. Um, and if we, I mean, it's even something we could just get the, the, the first memory, the one I talked about, the Falcon Point one, and then you could resign. And there's a couple VP in it for you and removing a token from the bag. So we could make it a quick like 20 minute scenario if we wanted to. That's that is an option. To me, this scenario, like, one of the big things that sticks out in my mind, um, in addition to just flooding shenanigans, are a couple of encounter cards. Um, so I think of this as, like, the baby deep one scenario. <laughs> um, yeah. Because there are a couple encounter cards that are really annoying. Um, one is deep one hatchling. Um, there's a few copies of this one. One, because it surges... Um, one of the rare surging enemies in Arkham. Um, and then after you engage it, you either have to lose an action or it attacks you. It doesn't hit very hard, but like this all adds up when it's surging. And I have had a hatchling surge into a hatchling surge into something else. Um, and then after you defeat the hatchling, you have to move the nearest ready unengaged deep one once towards your location. And that enemy loses aloof. And again, a lot of the deep ones have nasty engage effects. So the like this thing is annoying when it pops out because it's surging and because of the engage effect. Uh, but then if you kill it, it's also annoying and it might bring something on that's going to hurt you as well. Um, and then this kind of combos with the deep one nursemaid, um, which gives plus one fight and plus one evade to each other deep one enemy at its location or connecting location. And as Scott mentioned, like all those locations on the same row connect. So it's giving plus one fight, plus one evade to all of those. Um, but no big deal. You just engage and kill it, right? But when you engage the nursemaid, you have to uh, draw the top card of the encounter deck. So. Gross. Goody. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, there is uh, the deep one assault in here with the bull and syzygy mm. so <laughs> fun times yeah uh the pump room which is a key location basically the sean this is gonna be your job um because your agility yeah will baby be pretty pump sky master high. silas let's go yeah. so you test two intellect or two agility you're gonna go with intellect right yeah that's so. that's right um so if you succeed, choose two locations, decrease the flood level of one, and increase the flood level of the other. If you succeed by two or more, you may incre- you may instead choose just one location and decrease its flood level. So hopefully the idea is that your actions are just spent reducing the flood level of three locations every single round. Like, that is boring, but so important. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, this might be something too, Justin, if... Uh, we just need more pumping. Like these are Trisha's stats, so that might be a great one for you as well. I look forward to you telling me what to do. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's it's a fun scenario. I really enjoy this one actually. I find it very uh, active and yeah, tense. Yeah, uh, I'm out yeah. of here is a good tech card because the moon door whatever doesn't need to be. Um, unflooded for you to use I'm out of here just it has resign on the location so you can use resign so that's right neat little tech card. definitely gonna have that one mm-hmm. it's interesting too Ian because I was uh, thinking about what you could do based on some of these these cards because if you have adaptable um, mm-hmm. like there's you could have you could basically have two card slots in your deck that are just your tech cards. So it's like mm-hmm. fine clothes, I'm out of here, and pocket telescope. And you just rotate those two cards for each scenario based on which scenario it is. Like, yeah. my goodness, that's a a powerful option in this campaign <laughs> for someone that can take 
adaptable and those cards so yeah for sure I, I i do think a light in the fog just because of that campaign loss is gonna be um potential campaign loss resolution probably be the most tense we'll get until the finale mm-hmm. um but i think it, or at least no, since I, pit of despair yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes I, I was going to say it seems doable, but I'm not going to jinx us, so I'll, yeah. I'll just leave it there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think we just have to be very careful. Yeah. I, I think if I get an open gate at the start, I am going to put it on the resign location just in case we need to open gate out and resign before the resign location goes away mm-hmm. as a as a safety net. Something Makes to sense there to with me. that. Yeah. Again, the the open gates are just little life rafts. So uh, there are two memories in this one. Again, they are all critical. So if we miss one, we can just stop trying. <laughs> yeah. So then we go to uh, Lair of the Dragon. Uh, you want to talk about this one because you did the most of the notes on this one. Oh yeah. Um, so, Lair Wait, of Dagon. Dragon? Dagon. Dagon. Dagon so. Yeah. Oh, Dagon. Yeah, yeah. I was about to say, <laughs> this, this, Dagon. this scenario is going to be dragging these nuts all over our <laughs> <laughs> you are just, it. You're just krilling me with that extra R you're adding. Oh. Oof. <laughs> Oof. Yeah, so, so, so. Sounds good. Just so Dagon funny. Oh, my God. Oh. Stop. I can't. <laughs> No okay, more. Okay, it is it is shrimply time to move on. <laughs> I'm resigning out of this one. Um, That's the layer... episode title. <laughs> uh, layer of the Dagon. Um, I always <laughs> get this one confused in my mind with the previous one because they both involve like being topside somewhere else. Yes, and then you kind of move to basement flooding. Um, mm-hmm. So very similar in that respect, uh, but this one starts off with uh, an initial like few locations that we need to get through, and it's really just kind of progressing up from the the bottom floor to the, to the top for this one, um, getting what we need to do, popping back down, uh, then we unlock unlock the bottom chamber which opens up again those kind of rng flooded locations we're very familiar with by this point um and then we need to get to the final location um where dagon is sleeping uh and then we need to um pass some tests to basically like get our clues that we have onto the act um by passing some tests and once we do that then we can succeed uh, the problem is when we're at Dagon's location, every test we fail um, progresses him towards waking up, which we don't want. Um, and it also comes into play fully flooded. Uh, this this scenario requires a lot of clues, like so many clues, um, because you need clues to unlock each like new section of the map. You need clues to unlock the final location, um, and then you also need clues that you then put on the act. I think the final math we have here is something like uh, 36 clues oh. to to successfully uh, resolve this scenario. I changed my mind. This is the one that scares me. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, a lot. It's, like, it's only 12 full turns of cluing. And passing every single test with no compression. Oh, my goodness. No 12, 12 turns, That's though, fine. right? So, like, Justin, you and I, we each have six full turns with no compression cluing. It, it's a lot. I'm not saying it's impossible. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying it's not. It's just, yeah, it's a lot. But mm-hmm. it's not, it's not, um, it's not something we can't handle, I don't think. Especially at this point, this will be the seventh scenario. We'll be pretty upgraded. We'll have that compression. Yeah. I believe in us. Mm-hmm. 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 Justin keeping the pun play alive in chat. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we really, we really just need to be 
keeping up the clue pace, which means the killers, we need to be keeping the clue, the clovers free. Um, the other notable thing about this scenario, this is the curse scenario. Um, mm. So that's worth keeping in mind for anything in your deck that might play off that or be hurt by that. Uh, we start with a certain amount of curses or blesses, depending on um, how well we've done. Um in a kind of inverse way. So if we've done really well and have a lot of memories unlocked, we're going to start with a lot of curses in the bag. Um, which, which I mean, hopefully that's the case, that we've been doing so well, but that also means um, we're going to start off a, a little bit under the bag, as it were, <laughs> with all these curse <laughs> tokens. Um, there is this special statue we can, we can acquire from the Hall of the Deep, and that helps get curse ta tokens out of the bag and adds blesses. So that that's probably a priority early on, I think, is acquiring and flipping that special statue. Teachings of the Order is, uh, is going to come in pretty clutch, too. Hmm. Yep. Yeah. Map the area being a, a tech card. I might... I might, I mean, I'm going to have Rabbit Hole, so it's going to cost me 2 XP if I want to bring in Map the Area, because I don't know if I value Map the Area in the rest of the campaign, but this scenario, it might be worth the 4 XP to bring in 2 copies. Oof, that's no joke, 4 XP. It's not, but I am getting 28 extra XP over the campaign, <laughs> so that brings me down to like 24 extra. So I mean, like, if I if I plan correctly... I, I think for the the value that it would bring to this, I think it might be mm. worth it. Fair. Yeah. yeah so what what map the area does, if if you're not familiar, is um, basically you have to like pass a test, and then if you succeed, you attach it to the location, and it reduces the difficulty of all skill tests there by one. Uh, so so the idea is we would put it on that final location so that we're not failing tests and. Um, Waking Dagon. Don't yep. want to wake Dagon. Don't, Don't wake, wake Dagon. Dagon. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> he jolts up in bed and the sleeping cap flies across the room. Yeah. <laughs> we should just sweep Arkham off the table at that point and just play Don't Wake Daddy instead. To yeah. See if he wakes up. And if we win, we just R1 it. Just, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that sounds good to me. <laughs> Yeah, so again, I mean, I feel like we're a broken record, but it's like we just kind of got to do the thing on this scenario. Yeah, <laughs> do um, well. Hopefully the did first it. part is pretty straightforward. You just go through, get clues, get the keys, and then the bottom part is what we've done a few times by this point, which is just don't drown and uh, get clues, don't drown. Keep going. Mm -hmm. um, if we do fail... Um, on this particular scenario, then we get um, trauma from defeat. Uh, and if we do out, we get trauma and Dagon is going to be awake for next scenario. But we get to keep going. It's not a campaign loss. So mm -hmm. worst comes to worst, we get to play the last scenario, but it's going to be with a, a an awakened Dagon. Um, and if we do succeed on Layer of Dagon, then... This is kind of like the only choice really so far as what we tell Osiris. Mm -hmm. um, we can tell him nothing. We can lie or tell him everything. And pretty much what it does is just it adds a different bad stuff token to to the bag for the, the next scenario, which is the final scenario. Um, so kind of what I did is just look at what each of those bad stuff tokens are in the final scenario and thought about what's the worst one. So, looking at the bad stuff tokens for Into the Maelstrom, which is the next scenario, uh, the the one that I feel like is the worst is the Cultist, which is only minus three, but if you fail, you place a Doom on the agenda and can cause Gross. it to advance. Um, just, <laughs> Ancient just Eagles know. in the and, Chaos Bag? Cool. Yeah. That sounds great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anything that does that, especially on a final scenario, is just a no. So... That is the Tell Osiris everything, um, so that's the one we're not going to do. Um, <laughs> adding Elder Thing, the Elder Thing in the final scenario is a minus five, um, which is bad in itself. Uh, if you fail, there's a key on your location, you take a horror. 
Um, whatever, that's that's bad, but I think adding a negative five, another negative five is we probably don't want to do that. Um, so I think probably the best one is to lie to Osiris, which adds a tablet. The tablet is a minus four. If you fail, you either have to increase the flood level of your location or take a damage. Which, not great, but at least you got a choice there, potentially, and it's mm -hmm. not a negative five. One thing to note too, there's syzygy in this mm. uh, scenario, but only after completing Act One, gets added in. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah, it it doesn't have ancient evils, which is nice. Mm -hmm. So, we kind of have our pace to to get things done. Yep, and get those thirty six clues. <laughs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> And then we have the interlude, number four. Yeah, interlude is just like checking if we have stuff completed. Um, if the terror is dead and we discovered the life cycle of the deep one, we're going to start the next scenario with the green key. Um, and if we've defeated the gatekeeper, um, which takes place in Layer of Dagon, um, and we have at least one of those special relics, then we start the next scenario with the yellow key. So... Uh, it's it's really just checking memories and things we've done whether we start uh, the next scenario with certain keys and then so we go that in, takes us into the yeah. maelstrom <laughs> <laughs> into the maelstrom the big finale finish me off ian <laughs> <laughs> will do um so into the maelstrom it starts off with a set of location which we just need to essentially circle around and gather clues from um, while they're flooded potentially uh, and the things we've done in previous scenarios will determine which keys we start with so if we've done really well we will start with a bunch of keys um, and if not that means we have to gather a bunch of clues uh, keys at this point uh, so that's like the first part of the scenario. And then once we have the keys, we unlock the real end game of the scenario, uh, which is a bunch of locations. Um, and our goal is to which like start in a state of flooding and we need to unflood all of those locations um, by either spending clues or dealing damage to the big bads. This scenario also has... All four of the the wardings I have on certain uh, cards. So it has the autofail treacheries <laughs> set, a little <laughs> suite of those. It has the deep one assault slash bull. It has the ancient evils, and it has syzygy. <laughs> it is just, it just has this encounter deck is mean. Mm -hmm. So exciting, yeah, yeah. I... I'm really curious how this one is going to be in four player um, because in in one and two player, I've often thought of this as one of the easiest mm. uh, final scenarios in a campaign. Like Innsmouth has been really weird where it's a tough campaign overall. Uh, but my experience with Into the Maelstrom is it's one of the easier ones to beat. Um, but I'm just I'm just worried how some of those encounter cards chain in four player. That matches my experience as well i've <clears throat> mm -hmm. never had a ton of trouble with this one um but yeah like the i mean scott you just went through all the different encounter sets that we've, we've got <laughs> yeah. up against us it's it's not great it's it's not i feel like this scenario though it gives you the time to beat it but if you are going for that um epilogue ending uh you need an additional in four player 36 clues um because you need to uh or or a total of 16 more damage on each hydra and dagger so, so 36 damage uh, or sorry 32 damage um it's just there's so much other stuff to do so that it, it's almost like i feel like the scenario is built to allow you to have a chance to get the uh, epilogue ending by having certain doom clocks but if you're not going for the epilogue ending and you're just going for just no, super normal ending and not doing little side quests it offers, there's time. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. what I feel makes it, I don't want to say easy, 
but like you have that bad treachery that essentially takes your whole turn to deal with it's like well i have so many turns so it's not going to be that bad i don't know yeah that that's true that uh, that's a good point like one of the reasons it's felt so easy is because if you don't like this is the one of the only final scenarios that has like extra objectives to achieve mm-hmm. um with those special like alternate objectives you can achieve but you can only unlock those if you have certain memories um going into this um so i remember like my first few insmith campaigns like i didn't even get to access that content because i didn't have the right memories completed earlier in the campaign and i know some players were like a little bit upset about that that like that content's not available um and based on stuff you had done before Mm -hmm. uh but in an iron man um it, it, it's another place that raises that interesting question of like do you even bother with those alternate objectives um when you're in the final scenario of the campaign um maybe the game center is closing in like 45 minutes or something like <laughs> you might need yeah. to just blaze through to the uh to the regular ending in that case i fully expect that to be the case me too <laughs> I I expect us to at some point we're gonna miss a memory and then it's just gonna be like before we were like yeah we're before we were like a little nimble you know car driving along and then it's like all right here's the Mustang floor it just straight line right just like the the new version of Ghost Rider (laughs) it's a it's a Formula One car versus a dragster you know it's zip it along taking the turns or are we just going in a straight line as fast as we possibly can at risk of death yes yes <laughs> is the mm-hmm. answer to that <laughs> i am very much looking forward to watching in discord as people report in throughout the day to see when and how things go awry for people mm-hmm. at, at the varying points because it's going to happen i mean for all we know it happens to us scenario one right but yep. it's just going to be interesting to watch how I, I think that's how most teams will play of we're going to try, but then when not, it's just tear through and then start waving at the rest. Like, good luck suckers. Yeah. Get in loser. Yeah. We're going to, we're going fishing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It'll be interesting to see that kind of running tally over the course of the, uh, the day of like, who completed and how many memories did they get um Mm -hmm. i'll be a little bit surprised just time wise if anyone gets all 14 memories but i've been surprised before um yeah especially for those people (laughs) you're trying to say the exact same thing i was go (laughs) (laughs) well i'm just having memories of some of the tsu folks who like spent a ton of time and like i think it was what was it? Wages of Sin, um, like getting all of the uh, the specters. So I feel like, especially for those who might be doing this at home, like if you don't have that time pressure, you it, it probably more doable. Mm. Yeah, I was should... thinking back to the uh, the team in our TFA mm-hmm. Iron Man that like opted in to doing the secret mm-hmm. scenario at the end. That's of right. The... Turn That's back right. time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah we Still... should uh, if we think of it. Uh, look back at the discord chat afterward and follow up with people to see if they were playing in person or remotely and just report back at some point. Cause I think that would be just fascinating to see. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Maybe you have a little Google survey that they can fill out, see some stats. It'd be fun. Uh, speaking of fun, uh, XP Ian, you, you went through mm. and calculated all the maxes and what we can expect. I sure did. This is something I do for each Innsmith because I want to know, like, the total XP that I can plan around. Um, Because usually um, the way I do, because I'm kind of crazy, is just, like, have a spreadsheet where I pick out my selections for after each scenario. Um, So I kind of need to have an idea of how much XP each scenario gives you um, so I can plan out what upgrades I'm going to take after each scenario. So there's a total possible XP in Innsmith of 53. Uh, again, assuming you're not adding your own XP versus with player cards. But in terms of what the encounter cards are giving you, 53 total. Um, I like to do an estimate of like what's reasonable. 
Um, so, like, usually based on how hard a scenario is or how hard particular XP um, is to get, I like estimating how much XP is actually reasonable compared to the total. I, I usually play it a little bit safe because um, I want to plan for less XP and then be surprised if I get more. So I think probably around 38 to 40 is reasonable XP in Innsmith by the time you're going into the final scenario. Um, so that's kind of what I'm going to be planning around in terms of uh, getting to the, the final form. Um, but yeah, if, if you do really well, you might be hitting more than that. But I think that's a good kind of estimated target to go for. Um, I, one bad. of the weird things, though, with Innsmith is it has those couple of pauses uh, where after Into Deep you can't spend XP and after A Light of the Fog you can't spend XP. I kind of looked at this and I, I thought it was interesting. So if you looking at the reasonable amount of XP, um, at the end of Devil Reef, you should be able to spend about about 22 XP, and that's halfway through the campaign. So if like if the core function of your deck and the upgrades are at 20 to 22 XP, that's a really good marker that you'll be able to... Mm. Like if you can get your combo online... At 20 XP or 22 XP, you will have more. You will have half the campaign with that combo online. If that makes sense, like the needs to have versus the nice to have upgrades. Mm -hmm. So something to consider. Love that. Yeah. Yeah, and and I similarly, I think because of the weird kind of delayed XP in certain cases, like. The reasonable XP after the first two scenarios is eight, uh, but then you don't get to spend XP again until um, after Devil Reef, which is two scenarios later, like halfway through the campaign. So I think even more than other campaigns, how you spend those initial XP is a is a super important decision. Not to put you on all under pressure, but mm -hmm. <laughs> when thinking about spending those two XP. I mean, those initial 8 XP that you can expect, like, they have to be very, very important cards um, because they're going to have to carry you over for a couple more scenarios after that. Yeah, that's really good advice right after I gave my mediocre advice because <laughs> <laughs> you have to build an 8 XP deck-ish to make it to the middle of the campaign because you'll get 5 XP, or, like, assuming reasonable... 5 XP, 3 XP, 0, 0. Kind of. No, sorry. Your first scenario will be 0 XP. Second will be 5. Third will be 3. Fourth will be 0. Is what you're playing with. So, your level 0 deck... Yeah. 8 XP is what I'm saying. <laughs> Make sure your deck can function at 8 XP for a couple scenarios. Yeah. No. Yeah, for sure. It, and it also speaking... makes the. Oh, sorry. It, it also makes the 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 thick of it question mm -hmm. very mm -hmm. interesting, which we can talk about uh, more when we get into our decks in a second here. But yeah, because because of that weird structure, it kind of incentivized a little bit to to get that extra XP out of the gate. Yeah, it's a weird jump too, because you go from like eight XP to twenty two. <laughs> like right. you, so don't plan anything between 8 and 22 it's fine because you won't be there <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah yeah well what a scenario or what a campaign yeah yeah it's a it's a hoot and a half <laughs> when we're when we're coming up with this i felt a little bit bad because i'm like we're not gonna have really concrete path advice for people because there are no paths it's like do the thing good but <laughs> i i think Innsmith rewards preparation in terms of the small details. Mm -hmm. So the devil, the devil reef is in the details. The devil is really in these, like knowing that this encounter card is in this set and like this tech card is going to get you around it more so than like, Oh, here's the one path that'll get you where you want to go. I think it's very much a campaign more about tactics than strategy. Because it's not like that's a good way which, to put it. Which yeah. path are we gonna take? All this. It's like no. Be each scenario is very individualistic. Like this is 
figure out how to beat this scenario. There's no big choices. You just need to be ready for the challenges it challenges that it proposes. And as long as you're doing that for each scenario, you should be successful. But how you do in one scenario, besides the memories and going for the epilogue, I mean, some of them don't really affect the next one or the next one. You know, like, so those storylines um, aren't as important uh, gameplay-wise in this campaign as as compared to, like, something like The Dream Eaters, which is just an absolute web, no pun intended, of outcomes and all this stuff. So, mm-hmm. I mean, the pun was a little intended. It, I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right, well, we ready to talk decks then? Yeah. yeah. Let's whip them right. out. Whip, whip your deck whip your decks out. Yep. So we uh we had we had a ride kind of landing on on <laughs> what we're ultimately going to play as I kind of talked about earlier at least my own part of it. Mm-hmm. Um I think S- Scott probably was the only one who like threw his flag down on Luke and yeah. kept it there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's not going to be any uh doubt versus conviction uh talk out of me <laughs> the <This> last is... <laughs> minute <laughs> no this has been like i think a solid year of like i'm taking luke just mm-hmm. just so you guys know like just do whatever you want i'm taking luke so yeah i kind of feel like you've been talking about this even longer like once when we get to is in smith like i'm whipping out luke like <laughs> yeah it's time to shine yeah well i think too like the, yeah it might have been there's been a couple iron man where i'm like man this would have been great to have luke but I'm saving Luke for Innsmouth. Yes. <laughs> you know. Which I think is the right choice. Yeah. But, yeah, like Sean mentioned, for everyone, I feel every other Iron Man, we've ironed out our investigator choices a little earlier um, and easier, at least for myself. Um, almost every Iron Man I can remember being like, okay, I'm going to play this one and not really swapping. Uh, but I went through three investigators, I think, at least before settling on my final one. And I know um, both Sean and Justin as well um, went through a few choices. So I don't know what it was. I, I think it's because we've like had a few investigator that we've played already um, in past Iron Man's and just trying to figure out the right composition. But we really... Um, flailed around a little bit to be honest trying to figure out what we wanted to play well aside from scott i think what stopped me up was that we hadn't really decided on kind of like what is our our group level strategy Mm. for for the particular challenges here particularly for the enemy uh Mm -hmm. based challenges of this campaign um and we, we tried a few different things. Like I, I was like, all right, well, team soak Tommy, and I'm I'm just gonna soak all the extra damage and horror for everyone. And I don't know. I, I've talked about it on cast past. It was too slow. Didn't quite enjoy it. Wasn't having fun. So I, I reverted back to Silas. But then, like, what am I doing with Silas? Like, there's some traps and stuff that seemed like they could be interesting. But like in four player, I wasn't sure if it would be enough to to actually make a difference and not just like kick the can down the road and, and have to deal with it next turn anyway i don't think it was until ian was like hey what about sniping <laughs> that <laughs> that the whole thing started to take shape on the group level yeah and, and it was it's kind of cool in that respect because i feel like our choices in a lot of other campaigns is we just kind of each on our own we're like Oh, this is who I want to play. And it, it, it kind of just happened to fit together. Um, mm-hmm. But this is the most collaborative I think we've been in choosing our investigators and kind of bouncing ideas off each other. Um, I think that's fair to say. Because initially, yeah, I was thinking, okay, first thing I think of with N. Smith is Soak. So we were kind of talking through the Tommy idea, and then Sean took that on. Um, and then I was thinking, I think after that, I was thinking Joe Diamond would be perfect for N. Smith because he can get clues um but he can also fight and he can soak things um and i really wanted access to certain guardian cards because i had this idea for like blackjack 2 which lets you hit an uh, an enemy on someone else um but then i remembered that nick played uh joe diamond and dream eaters iron man and we don't necessarily have a hard and fast rule with each other that we're not going to repeat but for myself I just have this thing where I don't want to repeat an investigator. So then I was going to go Lily 
Um, I thought Lily would be interesting because she can cover a few different stats. Um, and she has a few different tools in terms of like some of the mystic like cancellation stuff um, combined with like just guardian fighting. Um, but then ultimately uh, I, w I went back to guardian um, and I, like based on your experience, Sean, where you were saying Tommy's too slow, I was like, well, who else can get out soak uh, more quickly? And then that's when it led me to Leo. Mm. Um and with this idea of, like, he can get a bunch of allies out. They can just soak stuff. Um, and he has some good, like, his agility is low, but he has good willpower for a lot of the willpower treacheries. He can fight. Uh, and then, so initially I was like, well, I, I love my never-ending flamethrower deck, so I'll put that together. Um, and then Sean in our chat, you're like, are you sure you want to do that? And in Smith, where everything hurts you for engaging and like, you have to be engaged <laughs> <laughs> for the flamethrower. Look, I love a fish fry as, as much as the next Catholic, but, uh, I, I, in the campaign where you're punished for engaging flamethrower seemed a choice. Yeah. The problem was I knew you were right as soon as you said it, uh, but there were two big problems. <laughs> One is... Um, I love that flamethrower deck, and two, um, I had come up with my my Insmith Fish Fry deck name, and I didn't want to give up the deck name. Mm. <laughs> so that was the important part. Uh, but then, <laughs> but then when that's that led me to thinking, well, I could do the exact opposite strategy, and instead of engaging and burning everything, what if I sniped them? Um, and so then that's how I landed on the Leo sniper idea of well i'm just not going to engage anything and just shoot them from afar that like to me as soon as you said it i'm like oh yeah like in the in the campaign where you don't want to engage you want to engage as few enemies as possible yeah sure just like never bother engaging them so that led me to go back to silas and uh as i alluded to earlier one of my key includes outside of just like my normal silas build that i really like is the uh, makeshift trap Mm. Uh, with which I will be taking um, net, which stops enemies at its location from moving and uh, potentially explosive device when we get a little bit later on. That was <laughs> that was ultimately what led to the, the Silas build I was talking about at the beginning of the episode where I tried a couple different versions. I went really hard on the like, oh, I'm going to bait and switch and move uh, uh, an enemy one location away so Ian can shoot it. I've got a trap, so Ian can shoot it. And, like, I, I put so many things in the deck uh, that by the time I finished the deck list, I, I didn't really clock how much of it was pushing me in that direction. So testing that was just a pain. I don't know. Either way, I think, I think less is more. In multiplayer, it's not going to be hard to just take an enemy off Ian so he can shoot it. So... <laughs> Then I think that leads us. Uh, well, we already told the story about uh, about Amanda, so mm -hmm. <laughs> Justin will be playing Trish, and Trish plays into this uh, this whole strategy very well because she can either just get extra clues off of locations with enemies, uh, or if in need, she can exhaust an enemy uh, with damning testimony locations away, uh, where again. Leo can either just regular snipe it or snipe it through the, the gate box, through the portal. Mm -hmm. I, so, I, no, I'm, I'm excited. I love yeah, that, that how the sniping works with the gate box location. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's just like, <laughs> when that box is open, you can see every revealed location with your gun. Like, it just... My goodness. the What's the name of the movie that we were talking about? The one where they bend bullets? With Angelina oh, Jolie, yeah. yeah, it's basically that movie. We're, we're yep. we are that team. I mean, I've been wanting to do you a want sniper it? build for a while. I've been, <laughs> I wanted to do a sniper build for a while uh, through a whole campaign um, because it's the kind of build that feels real good and standalone because you can just get all the pieces all at once. Mm -hmm. um, but it also wasn't that great in the past until the taboo was added to Springfield, of course. Yep. Um, and now we have some additional um, toys for the build. Like, I'm going to use custom modifications as well. 
um, which can let me do things like notch sight, where if I shoot it, an enemy engage with someone else and I fail, they're not going to take damage, mm -hmm. um, which is good for a sniper not to shoot everyone else on my team. <laughs> yeah. Um, Pro tip. And then also ex extended magazine, because I'm, I'm using some of the pieces from the flamethrower build where I just keep adding ammo, ammo, ammo to it and just keep refilling the, the sniper rifle forever is kind of the idea there. So, but, but yeah, I'm interested to see how it's going to play out over the campaign. That's why I was kind of harping on like those first eight XP. Cause I'm kind of, um, tormented on how I'm going to build this up because a sniper build at level zero just doesn't exist. Like it's not a sniper build no. at that point. Yeah. It's just, uh, it's just a regular guardian deck with aspirations to snipe stuff. Eventually <laughs> delusions so, of grandeur. You mean. <laughs> yes. So planning out the progression is going to be really interesting to, to actually be able to do stuff at level zero until I get to the sniping part. Cool. Well, do we actually want to kind of go over lists and key cards and whatnot? Sure. Um, I'll go over Luke a bit. I think I've talked about the key janky cards that I'm going to be bringing. Um, I must say I do love bringing Rabbit Hole now. I think this is the second time I've brought it to an Iron Man. Um, just because Rabbit Hole really rewards a lot of planning and what better kind time to plan your deck than than iron man um <laughs> so i'm kind of bring I'm, I'm not sure if i'm gonna bring mag glass or um hawkeye folding camera because hawkeye is better overall but it takes time to get rolling and mag glass mag glass just gets luke to an okay intellect thing but i'm also running sixth sense which i'm gonna upgrade um but I can also upgrade Maglas. So I, basically, I'm not choosing between willpower and intellect investigating. I'm basically doing both. Just use whichever one comes up first and when I need it. So uh, why not look at St. Hubert's Key? I have St. Hubert's Key. Just too expensive. Yeah. Oh, you? Oh, okay. okay. Oh, yeah. That's, that's in there. Yep. Um, fine clothes in the body. I was thinking the robes of Endless Night, but um, the fine clothes are just really good. So if I have extra XP, I might swap in the clothes. Uh, arcane... I think, hmm? I think like you could you could start fine clothes and upgrade into the leveled up version. Of course, that'll cost you more XP because you're rabbit holing. Yeah, but I mean like rabbit hole. I mean if you if you end up bringing in three or four cards that cost an extra XP, the amount of XP you're getting otherwise, you know what I mean? Like it's mm. if it nets you ten XP, that's still ten XP that you didn't have. Sure. So. Um, Arcane Initiate is my ally because finding spells is what Luke does. Mm -hmm. I also have Summon Servitor. I'm going to come back to that, actually. Uh, You're so, still rocking Servitor. Okay, all yeah, right. I, and I'll, I'll tell you why. This is my favorite part. Um, okay, I'm just going to talk about it now. I've been looking at ways to recharge the gate box because mm -hmm. um, that is just, you know, the best way to play. Uh, and I have Enraptured in there, which is why I'm running Magnifying Glass and St. Hubert's Key, so I can successfully get Enraptured to put sure, a charge sure. in there. But another way to charge the gatebox. Um, summon Servitor. Uh, as additional cost to play something, you must discard another asset you control. You can up upgrade it with Dreaming Call for 3 XP. Instead of discarding another asset you control in order to play Summon Servitor, you may return that asset to its owner's hand. So I'm just going to return the gate box when it's empty to my hand when I play Summon Servitor and then just play the gate box back down. Fully Love recharged. It. Yeah. Love it. That is my kind of jank. Yeah. So there, there's a little jank for you. Uh, barricade, I mean, it's I can play it somewhere else and it's it's Barricade. I mean, if you haven't heard me talk about Luke and Barricade, it's, it's jank. <laughs> um, deny existence because deny open gate because I can throw them anywhere and... You teleport. Uh, power word, because it's fantastic. Um, between down the rabbit hole and arcane research, um, power word is going to hit 10 XP very, very early. Um, and that's when power word really sings. Uh, I have two copies of Read the Signs and Spectral Razor in here. I'm, I'm questioning if I need both of them at two because I have Uncaged the Soul and... Uncage of Soul upgraded allows you to play stuff from your discard pile. So, depending on your how your clue, uh, I'll just yeah, throw yeah. in my two cents here. Uh, depending on how your clue kit 
ends up evolving. Mm -hmm. You might be able to drop read the signs. Yeah. But uh, as I play through this campaign, I'm reminded that being able to just pound out three damage in a single hit yeah. kills so many of the important enemies. And since you, in particular, can save anyone at any location, presumably, yeah, uh, I, I would keep those in. Okay. I might just drop the read the signs. That's that's kind of what I was thinking too, or going one and one. But yeah, because I'm currently at 33 cards, I got to cut a bit. Um, after that, I got Ward of Protection, which I'll be upgrading to level two, obviously. Uh, and then skills, I have two deductions and two enraptured. So I want to get more skills in there, but I also need to cut from where I am. So I'm getting close. I'm getting close. Lovely. Yeah. Ian, you want to walk us through your sniper build? <laughs> Yep, um, so this is my shooting fish in a barrel deck. Um, <laughs> I got uh, the Springfield, of course, taboo version. Um, I have a machete as an offhand weapon, just in case stuff gets through to me, um, with a bandolier to allow that to happen, obviously. Um, I am going to try to find room for Hallowed Mirror, just because there is so much damage and horror that I want to help out there i have a bunch of allies as you might imagine because it's leo um so venture to get more um bullets tetsuo to make sure i can find the springfield in the first place if it doesn't pop up early um and then uh as an upgraded ally i have i am i'm planning on brother x just to boost my willpower even more uh, but more importantly, I can use brother X to soak up damage and horror from everyone else at my location. So uh, the idea here is just to to help with some of the horror damage pressure for everyone else, in addition to the sniping part of it. Um, I do have a copy of handcuffs in there, just because handcuffs is good for certain enemies in Insmith, um, like the bull, for example. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, pl I'm planning on bringing in Adaptable at Scott's suggestion um, to just swap out some of these cards and swap in like I'm out of here, for instance. Um, I am going to take Charisma, of course, because more allies for Leo um, and stick to the plan because it's stick to the plan. <laughs> Uh, and then, like I mentioned, custom modifications uh, with uh, Notch Sight and the Extended Magazine. I might get some other stuff depending on XP, but this is kind of my like base level plan. Um, Dynamite Blast, which I'm going to put on Stick to the Plan, again, for any uh, murder balls that we run across. It's nice to have an option there. And then um, Extra Ammunition to load up some more uh, bullets. Telescopic Sight is the other key piece of the sniper build. So uh, when you throw that on the spring field, you're able to um, basically hit enemies two locations away. So mm. in order to have kind of the base level functioning sniper build, I need the spring field and telescopic sight, which is a total of 14 XP um, if I want two copies of each. So... That's like scenario not, three or four, right? Yeah, yeah. It's not cheap, so that so that's kind of my big um, concern is just making sure I can afford those. Um, like it's functional with just the Springfield. Like if you get two copies of Springfield, that's eight XP. But that's having nothing else in the deck to support it, which is a little bit nerve wracking. Um, I have Think on Your Feet to dodge out of the way of enemies that try to engage me. Uh, and then Take the Initiative and Viscous Blow is some skills. So that's kind of what I have so far. It's not fully... Um... Oh, and then Emergency Quiche 3, which is also part of my kind of everlasting build where I can um, throw extra supplies uh, on the venture um, if I want to. Um, so that's kind of everything for the build but i might swap out some elements um but kind of the key pieces are going to stay the same um everything that gets the springfield more bullets or lets me find it faster is kind of the core of the deck um the big question for me like i mentioned is the the thick of it question <sighs> yeah i mean i think you need what, it what is, is venturer two and two Yes. Yeah, Venture is two and two. Two health, two okay. calamity. 
Um, as is Tetsuo. Mm, I love Tetsuo. Mm-hmm. I was just talking with Nick about this. Like every uh, Guardian deck that I make nowadays, Tetsuo is my level zero. Tetsuo and Guard Dog are my level zero allies, and that's that's it. Mm. Unless I have a better reason. Just so solid. Yeah, I mean, Nick is so. I'm <laughs> I'm struggling with this myself. Mm-hmm. Um, because with Silas, you obviously take damage. Uh. And I've done okay, but there have been a few scenarios in my testing that have been real close. Like, to the point where if I had gotten mm. the Innsmouth look, it would have been over. So, that's that's not ideal. I'm going to figure out how to <laughs> pack some healing in this deck. <laughs> mm. Yeah, if it was most other campaigns, it'd be a pretty easy decision. Like, thick all the way. It's only because it's Innsmouth. Uh, but... I mean, Leo, it, like, it is built to pump out Soak. Um, and as I mentioned, like, it, it's very XP hungry, so I kind of feel like I need to take Thick of it. You know who is packing healing, though? Is hmm. um, every monster in Innsmouth, uh, once I get Power Word upgraded with Mercy. <laughs> so, it's, it's good. Just mm-hmm. Just letting you know. Yeah. That is legitimately comforting. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, good to and know. That, that will be, like, one of my first ones, so. Cool. Uh, well, I guess for my part, uh, let's talk about my Silas deck. So I think I've talked about this one in, in days past, because it's, like I said, it's my go-to Silas deck. It is a very lean, um, lean deck. It's got uh, Fire Axe and Meat Cleaver for the weapons. We're running Pete Sylvester as the ally, uh, running Dark Horse and Track Shoes. Dark Horse, of course, being a mid to late gameplay once I have the kit out. Um, and then Jury Rig, which I've talked about before. This is my favorite place for Jury Rig because throwing that on on the axe just to give yourself the extra little juice when you need it um, is, is pretty great for zero cost. I'm rocking Brute Force. I'm rocking Grizzled. I'm rocking uh, uh, the Makeshift trapped as Trap, as I said. And then just kind of your, your you know, the other skills you run with Silas. Daring, quick thinking, resourceful. I am, I'm going to try out Expeditious Retreat. Because I think this is, this is a good campaign for it. Especially if I'm able to get uh, the net trap down. And then evade two enemies, leave them there. Either it explodes if I've got enough XP in this deck. Or Ian can shoot them from afar. Yeah, so the, yeah. the probably the most contentious point here, because this is a pretty basic Silas deck other than that, uh, is that I am not going to play with uh, his normal signature cards. That might be controversial, mm. I know. Uh, a lot of people like the Harpoon in the net. I think they're pretty mid, personally. Mm. Uh, like, they're, they're fine. You have to be committing in order to get the damage boost, which mm-hmm. is trouble. So, like, just getting Dark Horse online... Uh, with Fire Axe or Meat Cleaver with with Pete Sylvester. Those are both really consistent damage dealers. Um, Brute Force, like we were talking about, Mm -hmm. being able to just get three damage in one hit kills a lot of the enemies in Innsmouth. Um, So, yeah, I'm pretty excited about it. I think your decision is correct. I think that the the net, the Harpoon and Net, um, work really well with a more generalized Silas and not mm. a Silas that is teched the way you have for Innsmouth. Yeah. Like you, and on top of that, like Siren's Call, uh, the weakness that goes with those two, mm, yeah. in a Dark Horse build, is a really bad time. Yeah. Um, because that, that is literally just a, a full shutdown until you can get those two actions to get rid of the, um, yeah. the weakness. And I have learned through very hard... Uh, earned experience and, and wisdom that, that that never happens at a good time. So, Too bad you can't power word enemies to take away weaknesses like that. Like, hey, <laughs> enemy, do two actions to take away something. <laughs> uh, or summon servant or something. But yeah. That would be tight. Amazing. Um, yeah. So, then that just leaves uh, good old Fish Scarborough. Yep. Um, so, Justin, I know you haven't had a chance to play this deck yet, but 
uh, kind of like we were talking about, uh, damning testimony is going to be the big one. So damning testimony allows you to investigate or when you investigate, you can choose an enemy at a, a location. And if you succeed your investigate, you can spend one of the evidence off it to get a clue from the enemy's location. And since you're Trish, when you get uh, one or more clues at a location with an enemy, you can either grab a second clue or evade the enemy. So that's, that's real fun. So you can either swipe three clues, four if you've got a, a deduction in there, or you can disable an enemy for a turn all in one fell swoop. So Nice. Um, on top of that, the the ideal uh, ally loadout is Jeanne Beauregard because she allows she allows uh, Trish to move the enemies and potentially the clues around where she needs them to be in order to do said fuckery with damning testimony, which is pretty great. Um, hopefully, upgrading into some Eon charts. Uh, I've got hiking boots as a one of in there currently. We'll see if that that ends up being useful. Um, but yeah, beyond that, pretty pretty standard Trish. Just a little bit of mobility, a lot of a lot of resources, and a lot of a uh, lot of cluing. I look forward to actually getting to play Arkham and try it out between now and Iron Man. <laughs> oh, we'll make it happen. We're gonna make it happen. Oh, we will. We will. So that's the team. Yeah, I'm pretty excited. Mm-hmm. Me too. Yeah, Ian, like you said, I, I don't think we've ever, like, actually gone through the steps of coordination as much as we have in, in this <laughs> yeah. Um Everyone always kind of just knows what they want to play, and it has ended up being good so far, but this one we mm-hmm. really had to think about it. So I'm hoping, yeah. I'm really, really hoping that this works out as well as we think it's going <laughs> to. <laughs> I hope so, too. Because it's going to be all so. the more disappointing if this falls on its face. I know. Even if it falls on its face. I'm going to take it as a win because mm-hmm. this is the first official Iron Man that I get to play with you boys in person. Mm. Mm. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. All getting right. I'm a little hype for Iron Man now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's finally yes. getting more real. I, we, we always say this, but um, worth repeating for me that Iron Man is like the equivalent of like what a, a tournament would be for a competitive card game mm-hmm. like this is the thing we think about and plan for um for like the entire year um and where everything comes together so Ooh, i can't wait i'm so excited mm-hmm. like <laughs> we've had so much uh in the lead up to buster con that's just been like drawing attention mm-hmm. to just like purely unsexy logistical things <laughs> yeah <laughs> right yeah uh, and and now that the majority of that is done, and the the con itself is literally on the horizon, and now we're we're we actually have a plan, and I've got a deck list, and like mm-hmm. all the things are real, and I get to just be excited now. So, yeah, it's pretty great. Yeah. All right, excellent. Well, uh, we hope to see everyone uh, for Iron Man who who wishes to play Iron Man, and good luck with your own <laughs> your own strategery. Um, boys, let's move it on into a little bit of tentacle time. Mm-hmm. Scott, what's been grabbing you? Oh man, it's been a lot of uh, Marvel Snap. Um, mm-hmm. Still playing that. What, uh, what What are you rocking right now? Um, I finally got Galactus, and so oh. I have just like it's not a very good deck, but I have been just playing the shit out of Galactus <laughs> because it is just so bonkers fun. Um. So doing that, and I was trying to like rank up a bunch, but I don't think it's going to happen much. Um, and then I also found a Kickstarter for or, or game found or whatever. Did you guys ever play the Firefly board game? Uh huh. Um, mm-hmm. So it they are coming out with like a, um, a what do you call it like a, a ultimate box set with every single thing they have made for that game, which has been a lot of different expansions. Um, wow. Yeah, and apparently it's going to have a really robust... <laughs> more more episodes thing. than the show. Yeah, there you go. Um, so... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yeah, I had to. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, apparently with a really robust uh, solo function as well. So hmm. I'm looking at getting that, and I actually started dabbling with... Um, playing the original solo 
just to remind myself if I like the game or not. And I do. It's just, honestly, it feels like an open world RPG on board game form in Firefly universe, kind of. And so, yeah, it's not a great game. I'm not going to say it's even in my like top 10. It's just, you know, I just enjoy it. It's just a popcorn munching <laughs> movie style board game to me. Um, Agree. And then I also got to play the Fantasy Flight, the Star Wars deck building game. I forget what it's called. The one that Caleb designed. Mm, I, mm-hmm. I think it's just Star Wars, the deck building game. Oh, okay. Right? Yeah. Um, yep. I found it pretty fun. I only got to play two games of it. Um, I definitely think the dark side has a bit more of a feel bad game because the light side has so much discard tech. Mm. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's, I, I think the light side starts off with an advantage because they have the force in the beginning and that gives you an extra resource and all this stuff. Um, but the, the way where you have to defeat three of their planets and they get, when you blow up their planet, they get to choose their next planet out of like a choice of like 10 and each planet does a different thing. You're like, you blow up one of their planets, which is part of your victory condition, but now you allow them a very powerful ability at that exact moment in the game. Like it, it, you finish your turn and then they can pick and it can like buy a giant ship from the, the galaxy where like the row in the middle, it can, um, can is, it, is it a Hoth? It's like every time you attack it, it's two less damage or something. Like, I don't know. There's a lot of really cool interactions that game and I'm, I'm really enjoying it. So I look forward cool. to playing it more. Excellent. Ian, how about you? A few different things. I've been trying to make more of an effort to play some of my, uh, kickstarter games that i haven't touched much um so i went back and played some games of unsettled which i think i probably talked about at some point but it's like a solo slash cooperative game where you're essentially like exploring a planet i mean trying to survive i think the big distinguishing thing is there's zero combat in the game there's no fighting like you're a scientist so it's basically all like gathering data and coming up with solutions to try to uh unlock the puzzle of how you beat each scenario so the first time i played um it's a it's a little bit of a dense game so i i didn't bounce off it but i didn't like get full enjoyment but uh, i played through a couple games more recently and uh, had a lot of fun with it and kind of unique theme in terms of like being more focused on the science of space or exploration versus blowing aliens up so that one is fun i think i'm gonna play that one more um and then the other uh, in terms of video games like uh me and the whole family have been playing a game that uh, i kind of bought on the whim for a switch for the switch called uh ultimate chicken horse (laughs) um so (laughs) this is like a indie game but it's basically like a party party game uh platform game builder if that makes sense so basically like if you think about a mario maker where you can like build a platforming Mm. level Uh, but it turns this into a party game where like each turn essentially you get this party box and you can select um like different elements of a platform game level like blocks to jump on or they could be bad things like a a flamethrower or a saw um and so you kind of you're like all working together to build this level but to make it hard for each other um and then you get points like if you can get your character through and survive the level before everyone else or um and get points for killing everyone else i don't know it's just a it's a it's a on the cheaper side i don't even remember how much it was maybe 10 bucks but it's a super fun game if you have a group of people to to play with each other in the party mode because i haven't really played another game with like that where it's like building platform levels together in party mode so it's a lot of fun that does sound fun yeah cool justin how about you uh i uh, have still been playing midnight suns uh, i'm done with the campaign but i'm doing post campaign stuff while i wait for storm to drop i think you and i <laughs> end up for about a, a week and a half there where there were theorized dates on either a tuesday or thursday every day it didn't drop we had angry messages back and forth and mm-hmm. now we at least know that she'll be out soon yes I think in a week 
Yep. Uh, so a week from today. Looking forward to starting a new playthrough when she comes out. Uh, still, still really like the game. I think it's great. Um, everybody go buy it so they make another one. Please. It's uh, so good. Yeah. Uh, then I have also, uh, and you're part of this too, Sean, uh, have been playing Returnal a little bit again. Mm. Uh, mm-hmm. Finally got a, a buddy of ours um, who we mostly get to play interact with via video games. Uh, he finally uh, had a free slot in his uh, catalog or, or working through his back catalog, and we've we've been telling him it's great, and he he's given it a go. And so then that got us back to playing it because since the time we had played, they added um, a two player mode, they added a, like a challenge dungeon. Uh, so that's that's been a lot of fun just to go back to in in uh, bits and pieces because man that game is just when you have the system down it's like butter it's It's ruined me to all third person shooters yeah and i'm not even a big third person shooter fan but holy crap it just it feels right Mm -hmm. so been doing that and then last thing for me uh is actually a music thing uh i've shared some of these tracks with a couple of of, well actually i think all, all three of you uh, it's a band called Rave the Requiem, but um, the the U in the word Requiem is a V because that's the that's the flavor of this band. <laughs> um, and they what? would I I would say they are let's say it's symphonic industrial metal <laughs> with some elect heavier electronica elements. I don't know how to describe them better without just listening to them, but it's like there is metal there. There's there's both clean and unclean vocals. There's electronica going maybe more in like the, let's call it near dubstep once in a while. But then they have a, a melodic singer. I, I don't remember the range, Sean. You can maybe know more about this, but I think she's a soprano and just then that's in there too and it's glorious it's the type of music where when it hits my brain like when i'm working i just zone in and listen to the same song on repeat and i'm like that is catchy as all hell and now it's three hours later and i'm not even mad (laughs) so been listening to uh, i've listened to them off and on for years uh, and they had a, a new album come out i think the end of last year so finally got into that um, side note, if anyone else listens to this band and they have a copy of the remix, the Requiem album that is no longer available, please message me. <laughs> we should talk. So that's me. Cool. Um, yeah, I took I, I took a lot of time last time, so I'm going to be pretty quick this time. Storm's coming out. Looking forward to stop talking about Storm not being out. So that's fun. Um, I've been, I've been doing a little bit of Arkham. I've been doing a little bit of champions here and there. Really excited about the new X Force stuff that's coming out. The X Men stuff is still just, it's real fun. I'm, I'm digging it. Um, and the, I mean, the biggest thing is I'm just, I've been getting outside again, like three days in a row <laughs> after, after like two weeks of just dog shit weather. And it is, it is giving me life again. So big up to, uh, Fresh air and touching grass. Mm. Touching grass. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us for episode 153 of Mythos Busters. We'll see you for the next one, and then we'll see you for BusterCon, hopefully. Bye. Bye. Bye.